Mayor, you are good to go. All right, I'd like to call the August 4th, 2020 Longmont City Council study session order. Can you start with the roll call? Uh, Mayor Bagley. Here. Council Member Christensen. Here. Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Here. Council Member Martin. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Waters. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. All right, Aaron, have you let us in pledge yet? You have, right? Marsha has, I know Joan has, Polly has, Tim has. All right, I guess Susie, if you have, I think we're back to me. So, all right, let's do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America, America. America. And, and to the and two two republic which it stands, one nation, 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 nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. For all. all. all right. Okay, um, just a quick reminder, anyone wishing to provide public comment during public invited to be heard must watch the live stream of the meeting for instructions. When the call-in information is displayed like this, please call the number displayed, enter the meeting ID, and then when asked for your participation ID, press pound. Callers will hear confirmation they've entered the meeting and be told how many people are already participating in the meeting. Callers are then placed on hold and muted until they are called on. You'll be called on by the last three digits of your phone number. Please remember to mute the live stream when you are called upon to speak. Comments are limited to three minutes, and I will unfortunately have to cut you off no matter how awesome your comments. All right, we have a motion to direct the city manager to add any agenda items to future agendas or any other issues. Dr. Waters? Yeah, it's not a direction to staff so much as clarifying uh, one, a part of our conversation in a motion or in, a, in an action uh, in our discussion, the study session on um, uh, short-term rentals. So much of that discussion that evening focused on non-residential property owners and what they can and can't do consistent or inconsistent with the ordinance. Um, late in the meeting, uh, Council Member Peck offered a motion that I seconded and voted for. And um, I just want to clarify what my, 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 my thoughts were in, in intent. Um, I was concerned the next morning that um, that motion would, would change um, the current ordinance that allows a Longmont resident property owner to own another property that they could use as a short-term rental, which the ordinance currently allows. Um, and I, when I went back and listened to the meeting and the motion, I, it sounded like that the intent was to take that out or eliminate that from the ordinance, which wasn't my intent. Um, and I did check with Don Burchett the next day to say, uh, to ask Don what, what he heard. And I, I don't, I think Don told me that my impression was that that, that, that wasn't going to come back as a change in the ordinance. But this, I want to clarify, and I don't need, I don't want to debate it. I just to clarify uh, with Council Member Peck the intent of that motion and, and just be clear. What I don't want to do is have staff working on something that comes back and I'm going to vote in a way then that might be different than I would have voted the other night. Uh, because of some confusion, my confusion, about what the intent of that motion was. Um, so, Council Member Waters, uh, you're correct that it would be, uh, I think, if I recall correctly, the, the motion was to make the second uh, residence a maximum, no, a, min a maximum of 30 days as a short-term rental. Was it maximum or minimum? I can't remember exactly what the word is. Maximum. Maximum. Yeah. yeah. That, um, that would be a maximum of 30 days that they so, can. So, just so I can clarify, a property owner, somebody who, a resident, yeah. living in their home, if they have a second home, could be an ADU or another home in town, the ordinance currently allows for them to use that as a short term rental. And the intent would be to continue to allow that. Is that? Yes, but not have it be a hotel where they're running people in every weekend. And well, that would be a short-term rental. That would be a um, a ma that would be the a short-term rental would be the maximum thirty days. Right. Um, well, for me, well, uh, I just want to clarify for the staff as people are working on that ordinance. That's I don't want it personally. I would rather not see that come out. I think I voted for a motion that might 
caused that to come out of the ordinance. And I just want to clarify what my confusion was and my, what my intent is. So hold, hold on, time out. So Don, can you pull up the minutes from last meeting and read back what we voted for? It was the June, it was July 14th. Yeah, Here. just one moment. Thank you. As Is she's that? doing that, there's a second issue um, what? that what? I just want to be clear on. Uh, I heard Councilmember Martin raise a concern about uh, a very unique circumstance where you've got residents in a property owned by a Boulder County, not a Longmont, but a Boulder County resident in which they place their parents that are living there full time and want to use rooms in that home as a short term rental, which doesn't doesn't comply with the ordinance. But I want to say I, that's a circumstance that seems to me that we ought to figure out how to make an exception for that's in, in such a unique circumstance. And I'll, I'll I'll be quiet. I don't want to rehash the whole thing. I just um, I don't think I was clear in my in my thinking or in my in my vote that evening. And um, I just want to I just want to be straight with the record and with other council members. Well, to add to confusion, I don't remember any of that being in the motion, which is why I'm asking for uh, clarification on what we voted on. So, Mayor, if I might. Councilmember Waters, which motion were you trying to clarify? Uh, it was a motion late in the meeting. Um, a council member Peck moved and I seconded it. Um, and I, what I was focused on was non-residential property owners, which had been most of the discussion that night. And as I went back and listened, if, what triggered it was the article in the paper the next day that re, as it reported, I thought, gosh, that's not, that's not, a, reflect what my intent was. So that's when I called Don. And then I went back and listened to it. And now I understand why the report, the paper reported the way it did. Um, I, so I just want to, I just want to clarify, I understand there, it's too late to do a reconsideration and those kinds of things. Um, I just don't want to, I don't want to confuse whatever that is. I don't Here's the motion. Staff. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Here's the motion. Uh, Council member Peck moves seconded by council member waters. Uh, to take away the ability to permit a second term, second short-term rental that is not owner-occupied and clarified that a property owner could have a second investment as a long-term rental. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So essentially what we did, so what I mean, we're going to have to come back on first and second reading, is we are prohibiting anyone from, ha from, from having a, a short-term rental or an Airbnb if that is their a second home or a second residence in Longmont. And uh, we're only going to allow them to own a second residence and rent it out so long as they're renting it out for over 30 days. That's how I understood that, which, which means that anybody who has a second home, so if the, I could live in Longmont, and if I have a home, I am no, a, a second home, I'm no longer allowed to rent that out except for long-term, over 30 days. What was our vote on that, Don? Five to two, I believe. It was five to two with uh, okay. Mayor Bagley and Councilmember Martin dissenting. All right. Thanks. So, all right. And then, uh, Harold, do you know when that's coming back? Joni on here. Mayor Bagley, members of council. So we are currently reviewing drafts of ordinances um, from some other communities that have recently changed their regulations to assist us in bringing back something that addresses some of the enforcement issues we talked about. Um, and so I do not have a date certain at this point, however, would like to try to get that on the agenda in September if possible. Okay, great, Councilmember Martin. Um, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I just wanted to say for, for the information of the staff, was that the reason that I voted against this was two reasons. One is it makes someone local with a second property the same as an, someone who's not local with a second property because anybody can have an investment property that they rent out long term. And second, um, I think that all of the problems that our constituents are concerned about are matters of enforcement um, and not a matter of code. So in other words, if, if both code enforcement and the police understood who was a, 
uh, who was a short-term tenant, um, then uh, they would be able to gather enough data that uh, persons, uh, re uh, landlords who are not seeing that their tenants are well behaved could lose their license. Right now, we don't have enough uh, enforceability to allow that to happen. So I think we totally focused on the wrong thing, and that was why I voted against it. Councilmember Peck. So again, we're, as we start, I'm going to Councilmember Peck, you, then Councilmember Christensen. We're not. We just Council Dr. Waters only asked for clarification. There is currently no motion, no decision to be made. Just reminding everybody that. This is just talk at this point, and we have a, we have things to get through. But Councilmember Peck, actually, that's exactly what I was going to say. This discussion okay. didn't help not happen on the first reading. Can we get back to our agenda, please? I would agree with you, Councilmember Christensen. Do you agree? Yeah, let's wait until we uh, <clears throat> until it comes up to rehash it again. I I disagree that we focused on the wrong thing. Anyway, let's get back to. Whatever. I do have something I would like to um, okay. say. Go ahead. Um, tonight we're talking about um, RVs, and I, I want us to just stay on that. However, there are several parts of that code that I would like to bring back for discussion. One of which is that I've lived in a lot of places, and I've never lived in a place where you couldn't park for more than 48 hours on the street without risking getting towed without even a warning. And I think that needs to be fixed. So I would like to bring back that part of the code. Also, I've never lived in a place where you could have uh, your car towed out of your driveway for having an expired, without warning, without having, um, um, for having a, an expired sticker, which is a very easy thing to have happen. I, I just think we need to look at other areas of that code and I would like to have a discussion, uh, you know, in the next six months, okay? All right, well, before-, before I, we... I would move that we bring it back for, I would direct staff to bring it back in the next six months so we can discuss other aspects of that vehicle uh, ordinance. I'll second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, we can vote on that. It's been, there is a motion, it has been seconded, but my understanding is, uh, Harold, if you could just, maybe shoot us an email or have Eugene shoot us in the Eugene. I don't know if you're on here, but if you could just shoot us an email, what the current state of the law is, because I do believe that um, junk vehicles already, I mean, unregistered vehicles or junk vehicles aren't uh, removed from private property, but only to be removed from city streets and city property. Um, I, if it's happening, then they need to get an attorney and point out, Harold, do we remove pro uh, citizens, private property in the form of vehicles? If it's, Unregistered? Oh, I'll have to ask Joni to get in, but I think it depends on the nature of the code case that we're dealing with. I'm probably. Well, if, you could, if you could just shoot us a yeah, we got to get you the detail. That. We got to get you the details on that. But most of the cars they they tag are actually on public right of ways. And then the other thing is, I also the other question is the 48 hours of uh, uh, what the process is for giving warning and then removing RVs and other vehicles from the street if they've been there for longer than 48 hours. Yeah, Joni was nodding, so it is a tag when they're on the public right-of-way. Yeah, so if you could just, we can, we can vote on it though. Councilmember Christensen? Uh, I had my son's car towed from in front of our house without any notice because his, his uh, ticket, his uh, plate was expired by a month or a month, six weeks. And that cost a whole lot of money. There was no notice given. It simply disappeared. And when I called to report that, this was a number of years ago, when I called to report the stolen vehicle, they said, oh, no, we towed it. But it was a Friday. So I had to pay for the entire weekend. I don't think we, this is the kind of city we need to be. So if that's still going on, we need to change that. And um, I know people who've had their cars towed from, their property for having an expired plate, so. Yeah, let, me, let us get you the details because now I think they should, Jeff's on, I think Jeff, they should post a sticker, right? Yes, uh, especially on private property, but on public property or a public street, we would tag it 
and give the owner a chance to remedy it, and then we will tow it. Uh, hardly, unless it's a, a junk, a completely junk vehicle, we we generally give people a opportunity to move the vehicle, especially if it was parked in front of somebody's home and it registered to that home. Um, Councilman, just... go ahead, finish. I thought you just you just skipped out on me. Uh, uh, Deputy Commander Satter, go ahead, please finish. Oh, I, we would tag and give people notice. And if it was parked in front of somebody's home, we would probably even knock at the door and let them know they need to update their tags or move the car onto the property. Uh, we, we generally don't remove cars from private property uh, unless it's un, uh, under some other circumstance, but it's not for expired plates. Councilor Peck? Um, basically, I think that uh, the uh, motion was that we want to see this in the code, not to discuss it. And I think, uh, Mayor, you were correct in asking Eugene to bring back the code. And let's see if, if, if that's actually what it states. Is, is that correct, uh, Holly? Uh, yeah, because in the, in the code, there is no mention made of a notice. And in fact, I got no notice. My son got no notice. The other people that I know have had their cars towed without from their private property that were not junked cars, they were perfectly good. But as I said, this was a while ago, but I'm talking about what the ordinance actually says. It doesn't say that there will be a notice given. It doesn't say any of that. It says 48 hours and your car can be towed. If you don't have a current plates, your car can be towed. It needs to be more explicit in the code. We'll look at it, we'll, we'll get that to you. Thank you. Hey, do you guys wanna have a vote on that? Or do you want to just wait till we get the information first? It's up to Council you, Public. Or Councilwoman Christensen. Um, I would like to have it come back. Okay. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm going to care, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Just, um, I'm just looking at my notes. I, I thought, well, I thought tonight was a, was the follow up to a, a motion that I made on August 6th of 2019 to, to bring back the RV ordinance. And in that discussion, uh, Mayor Bagley, you indicated that you would work with the city manager to get this on an agenda. I thought this, I thought what tonight was that. It is. So we but, get, but, so all aspects of the ordinance correct. we can dig into. So right. I guess I'm just, I think tonight's the night that Council Member Christian said that um, to dig into these things. Councilor Christensen. The reason I brought this up is I don't want to discuss this tonight. It's really, we have a lot to discuss with the RV ordinance. And I, I don't think this, this has nothing to do with the RV ordinance, although it is part of the same ordinance, but it's complicated. And what we need to talk about is RVs tonight, as we all know, that's enough of a mess. <laughs> All right, uh, I guess the seeing nobody else, I guess I'm gonna vote against it only because my understanding is that the law already does what I think that you're trying to do. Um, uh, you cannot have a 40, I mean, unless they tag it, they can't prove the 48 hours, at which point they don't have a legal case. So it's already happening just naturally. Um, and uh, and if you've got the, the definition of junk vehicle isn't that your vehicle doesn't work, it means that it's not registered. And so, um, and so, uh, I think by public policy, we should continue to require people to register their vehicles. So anyway, um, let's go ahead and vote. Um, I still, it sounds like Harold, even if this fails, I would like it. I, I think that we all want to see it in email, just what the current status is. If I'm wrong, let's bring it back. All right, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. 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 All right, raise your hand if you, let's, I, I heard no. A lot of them. Raise your hand if you're voting for the ordinance or the motion. Okay, the motion passes four to three. Please bring it back for the next six months, Harold. And if you could shoot us an email to save us time, that'd be awesome. I'll work with Eugene on that. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and uh, 
seeing nothing else, let's go ahead and move on to special reports and presentation. Actually, let's don't. Let's go to public invited to be heard. Let's take a three minute break as we allow people to get in the queue and then we'll cut it off. All right, back in three. All right, let's go ahead and get back to public invited to be heard. How many do you have in the queue, Don? Sorry, Mayor, just a moment. Uh, we have six people at the moment. Perfect. Are you ready to hear those speakers, Mayor? Uh, we are. Okay, and you got the timer? Ready? I do. Very good. Well, callers, we're going to um, unmute you by after we uh, call your the last three numbers of your phone. So caller 348, I'm going to e unmute you. Can you hear us now? I can. Would you please state your name for the record and address, and you are ready to begin. So my name is Patrick McClintock. My mailing address is 1100 East 17th Avenue, C105. 
The reason that's an emailing address is because I live in an RV. Um, I'm calling to represent as someone who doesn't fit the stereotypical Walter White Breaking Bad uh, resident of an RV. Um, I decided to call in especially because of the article from the Longmont Leader. Um, I'd like to specify that I am a long-time taxpaying resident of Longmont. I've been living here since I've been four, since I was four, and I'm not a vagrant. Um, I decided to live in an RV a little over a year to, year ago to allow me to stride towards career goals as well as to get out of being devoured by debt. Um, prior to COVID, uh, I actually had a flipping business that was gaining momentum. And then when COVID occurred, that kind of put a damper on that. But now I'm on the path for another career because obviously I do not want to live in an RV forever. Um, I'm not a trashy person. My RV is old, but it's in good shape and the tags are legal and up to date. And on top of that, I have a good re relationship with my neighbors. Um, I have permission from the resident I'm in front of to park in front of their house. I uh, even help them with house projects and uh, I've actually become really good friends with them. Um, I dog sit on a regular basis for another one of the neighbors I'm nearby. Um, I just want to point out I don't leave trash around. Uh, I go to properly dump waste at Boulder County Fairgrounds. And when Boulder County Fairgrounds was closed during the first part of COVID, I even went to St. Vrain State Park to dump. Um, so if the city decides on to ban RVs, I literally don't know what I'm going to do. And that's not only about where I'm going to live, but also what to do with my personal belongings. Um, even though I do have a career started, um, it will be a little while till I get a consistent income. So at this point, I'll have no choice but to pitch a tent at Roosevelt Park, which I really don't want to do. Uh, with that said, I ask the city council to consider and even show mercy to those of us who aren't causing the problems with the RVs. And when the city does decide on what to do, I ask that you please don't punish me for the actions of a few. And thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you very much. Next. Caller with the phone number ending in 410, I'm gonna unmute you. Please state your name and address for the record. Can you hear yes, us? Yes, hello, my name. Go ahead. I can hear you, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. My name is Ed Towers and I live at 1534 South Kaufman Street. I'm calling this evening to voice my concern and frustration over the decision to make South Kaufman Street a collector street from being a local residential street without allowing the residents of our street, South Kaufman, um, any public comment. My concern with this project is that the city has misrepresented their intentions from the start. The city wants to make South Kaufman Street between Pike and Quebec a through street but the street goes through a residential development with all of our driveways facing the street. Over the last, we've, we've been in this house for 20 years and over the last couple decades, since the development of Prospect, Rainbow Ridge, Creekside, we've seen increased through traffic from Pike to Quebec on South Hoffman. And that's because it allows drivers to bypass traffic lights on Main Street and also offers a quick access to Pratt Parkway. There's several problems with having the through traffic. It not only increases the volume of traffic coming through, but the typical speeds are well above the posted 25 miles an hour. This endangers pedestrians, bicyclists, children playing, and people either pulling into or out of their property. So I would, I would like the city council to state why it is acceptable to have a non-local Southmore Park traffic cutting through our residential development, essentially using our street as an arterial street. And, and that's my comment, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, next. All right, caller with phone number ending in 618. I'm going to unmute you. Please state your name and address for the record.
Let's go ahead and read it again, Don. Well, that caller seems to have hung up and disappeared. I will try another one. Okay. Caller, phone number ending in 932. I'm going to unmute you. Please state your name and address for the record. Go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. This is Tara Towers at 1534 South Coffin Street. I was wondering if the city council was aware of all the exceptions and judgments the Department of Public Works had to make in order to place the traffic signal at the intersection of South Coffin Street and Pike Road. This traffic signal goes against city standards, ordinances, and the Envision Longmont Plan, as well as NUTCD and FHWA guidelines, making the decision to place it at this location based on engineering judgment and Department of Public Works modification or exception. When we received the letter saying the scope of Pike Road Improvement Project, I had no disagreement with the fact that we needed crosswalks or turn lanes at that intersection. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I did not take the time off from work to attend either of the five o'clock Wednesday meetings in February of 2019. While talking with the traffic engineers in June, it was brought to my attention that a traffic signal was being installed. And during my research to find out why it was being installed at this location, the answer I received from the city traffic department is because of public comment and that the warrant is met. There has been at least 25 years of public comment regarding Pike Road requesting that safety and environmental concerns of the existing residents are taken into account while developing this area of Longmont. And according to the Federal Highway Administration, which has incorporated the MUTCD as their standards, just because a warrant is met does not necessitate a light being installed. Engineering judgment must be exercised to take into consideration the adjacent use land uses. This light is being placed on a local residential street, which is defined by the city's traffic mitigation program manual as intended to provide access to property. These streets are not intended for through traffic movements, end quote. The Envision Logmont plan defines the functional priority of a local residential street as access only and limited mobility. There is not another local residential street in the city that has a traffic signal installed on it. The city has repeatedly told the residents on our street that the functional classification will not be changed with the installation of this traffic signal. However, last week, we noticed that our street is on the collector street prioritization list that the traffic mitigation website has posted. The stretch of South Coffin Street between Pike Road and Quebec has already been started. The process of working with the city's traffic mitigation engineers to address the fact that the through traffic has gotten out of control. This light will be legitimizing our street as a thoroughfare, giving out of town traffic that gets stuck at that light, the idea to cut through our neighborhood to reach their destination, engineering, endangering our children as they are going to school and the many residents and bicyclists that utilize our street. After city council meetings last May, council members met with the residents along Pike Road to further discuss the improvement project. I never received an invitation to any meeting to discuss this other than the one for the public meeting held in February of 2019. The voices of the many residents on the north side of Pike Road have not been heard on this decision, and those that have voiced their concerns have been brushed aside. Our 81-year-old neighbor that lives on the northwest corner of this intersection has attended nearly all city council meetings regarding Pike Road during her 47 years of residence in the neighborhood. Her yard has been torn up. The road is encroaching on the very small easement she has between the road and her yard, and she is just beaten down because the city has never taken her concerns into consideration. This whole process has more than disrupted the convenience of our lives. This is endangering the neighborhood safety and reducing our property values, and it's not okay. Thank you. That's Thank you three. for listening. Thank you. All right, next. Caller with phone number ending in 119. I will unmute you now. Please state your name and address for the record. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, go ahead. Uh, this is Karen. Uh, this is Karen Dyke. I'm at 708 Hayden Court. Mr. Mayor and council members, I want to begin by thanking this council for contracting with Dr. Helmick to conduct air monitoring at Union Reservoir and at Longmont Airport. Adding this data to the research conducted on, conducted on air pollution from fracking is very important. I follow this data closely. However, Dr. Detlev Helmig's presentation on the benzene spike and the direction from which this benzene must have originated is somewhat stunning. As an RN, I'm extremely concerned about the health effects from this benzene pollution that occurred. Based on this presentation, I'm asking that this council take several steps. The first is to renew Dr. Helmig's contract this month. When we have this type of alarming health data, we must continue to have this information. I realize that COGA would like to shut down Dr. Helming's monitoring, but please don't fall into the negative information they spread. Second, the benzene levels seen were at dangerous levels. Please set up a real-time warning system so that people in the path of this pollution know to close windows and keep children inside. 
And lastly, it is time to connect with neighboring cities and counties to pressure COGCC, AQCC, Weld County, and our governor to stop this pollution. SB 181 needs to be enacted now. Taking years to write regulations before protecting residents is not okay. All permitting must be stopped until this law is fully implemented. Please see if you can um, add your voice to uh, the COGCC website. Drilling will soon begin on the large night well. This well is on the north side of Union Reservoir. To those who live on the east side of Longmont, I urge you to begin following the data found at Bold Air. That's B-O-U-L-D Air. Make sure the air is clean enough for your children to breathe before they go out to play, especially if they have asthma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Dyke. All right, last but not least, we have one more. One more. Uh, caller with phone number ending in 811. I will unmute you. Please state your name and address <laughs> for the record. Hi, my name is uh, Deb McClintock. I live at 1100 East 17th Avenue. Uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and council members. While looking for the meeting tonight, I found the vision for Longmont in the next 20 years written on May 18th, 2018. People in 20 years, Longmont will be the world's greatest village where children are the most fortunate to be born and raised. Elders are supported through their entire life's journey where people will have access to food and shelter and everyone has the opportunity to thrive and feel they belong. Tim Water stated, uh, one of his goals for Longmont is to become the most compassionate community in Colorado. These are all admirable visions and goals. The city wants to ban all recreation vehicles from public streets. Where can these people go? Are the RV dwellers going to feel an opportunity to thrive and feel like they belong? My first thought was we are in the middle of a pandemic, a health crisis. We have been in lockdown, closing up businesses, stores, restaurants, etc. People have lost their jobs, mental issues are at their all time high, suicides, abuse, violence, and, and on and on, all time, uh, their, their all time records. Uh, food banks are having trouble keeping up. So I ask, is this a good time to ban BRBs? Is this showing compassion? People are living in what they can afford. Do we want to cause more homeless people? General, generalizations are made in the report. Number one, people don't have a proper way to dispose of human waste. Untrue, Boulder County Fairgrounds has a dump station. It was closed in March, but now open since June. People leaving trash, maybe a few, but not most. You can see the same thing in residential housing too. Trash, weeds, high grass, etc. Number three, can you safely assume that all RV dwellers don't want to improve their lives. All I saw in the Longmont Leader artic article was negative generalized statements with no solutions. Longmont is better than this. I asked the city council to consider the season we are in, a, pandem a pandemic, a health crisis with economic consequences, maybe a tabling of a decision for more time to work on a solution that would be uh, available for the to help these people. Don't let a few bad apples ruin it for the rest. Let's find solutions to allow for these RVs to stay, RVs to stay on the streets, most of which are parked in industrial or out of the way places. Some are parked where people allow them to stay. I ask that we show compassion, continue to work on providing affordable housing as Polly Christensen has promoted. See if we can find a solution for all the homeless and RV dwellers instead of a complete ban. Thank you so much. All right, good timing. Thank you very much for your comments. All right, that concludes today's public uh, invited to be heard. Let's go on to special reports and presentations. Harold, an update on COVID-19. You have one for us? Yep, I'm gonna go share my screen and go pretty quick. I also have David Bell here um, to really do the bulk of the presentation in terms of a continued update and what we're seeing at some of our parks related to the um, COVID-19 or what we're seeing now. Um, can you all see my screen? You see charts? Yes, Harold. 
So um, this is the same chart that I've been showing you before in terms of the counts um, that we've seen in, in Colorado. And you can again see the shape of the curve. A um, bit of a peak here. We're not sure exactly what that is, but generally um, over the last week or so, um, it's been trending in the right direction, but for that day. Um, I don't know why it does this. I've been trying it out. Um, uh, again, you're seeing the, the chart, on, this one on the number of deaths. Um, it has, you know, been a lot lower than we've seen early on in this. You can see some spikes, but you're also seeing some days where there's, there, there hasn't been uh, a death reported. Uh, the big number here is really looking at this chart with the positivity data. So you can see that um, it was at 3.53% on August 2nd. Um, August 3rd, 4.34%. So uh, the state number is still down below 5%, which is, is really, it, you know, they wanted to see that continuing trend moving downward. The Boulder County data, um, I can tell you that we're, we're seeing, uh, Again, you can see the same trend. Um, we've had some spikes within the caseload and what we're seeing as a, as a community. Um, again, looking at this overall percent positive test for PCR, 5% current five day average, 3.2%. I've actually had some questions that say, um, why are you focusing on the current five day um, average percent um, positivity rate? It's because that's what really tells us what's happening now with the cases versus the, the 5% is, is really um, bringing in the positivity rate that you see on this chart. And so what we're really looking at is what's happening today based on that positivity rate and what those cases are trending to do. So. Um, at least in Boulder County, you can see that we've we've really been below that 4% range for some time. And so that's, that's really good for us and seeing what's going on in our community. Um, again, when you see the growth in cases, it is, you know, I keep harping on this, but what we're really seeing is in this 20 to 29 year um, group in terms of where the, the majority of the cases we're seeing are coming in. Uh, and that's important because when you see the five day average of new cases, you can see where we hit this peak, we were trending down and now we're just ping ponging in terms of those cases. We look like we were doing pretty good and then we started moving up again. Um, when you look at what's happening in the community, we have had some growth. I think the last time I talked to you, council, we were at um, around 630 cases, uh, 638 cases in Longmont. We've moved up to 666, uh, 747 in Boulder. Um, and, and so we, we have had some growth in cases in the last week in our community. Um, again, just sort of seeing what we're tracking in, in, in terms of um, race, ethnicity, uh, and those issues. Um, this number here was actually down to 36.2. So we're seeing some, you know, uh, fluctuations upward recently um, in, in, the, in our Latinx community. And so we're trying to uh, understand what that looks like. But that's really what's happening with the cases in our community. Obviously, um, we, we see a lot on the news in terms of what's happening. Um, the good news for us is we're not seeing the uh, same impact within our um, long-term care facilities and, and people go, well, obviously it's good news for any number of reasons, but it's really also the strain that it places on the medical system. We're not seeing that as much as we saw early on in the event, but um, it is, um, you can see that it is in different areas of the community. In terms of our hospital status, um, everything seems to still be in the same range that we were in. Uh, when you look at med surge beds, it has moved a little bit into the red, but again, you have to keep in mind that that is based on uh, elective procedures still being done. Um, and when you see in the ICU beds, it's really kind of remained in this area. When we get the updates and we're not seeing um, as many cases of COVID in the hospitals being reported um, as we were early on. So that's also a good a bit of information, but we're still seeing case growth uh, in our, our community. 
Um, and again, I think it's just really important to, to focus on social distancing, wearing the mask, um, and then just good hygiene practices in general. There's been some recent studies that have come out that really said, if we can just do those things, it'll help us um, really get a hold of the numbers. We're still watching everything pretty close. Um, just so you know, we got an email from uh, and our phone uh, notification from the school district today. I don't know if you've all heard this. Um, I think it's going to be online classes until I'm going to look at council member Hidalgo Faring to make sure, but it's going to be online classes until the end of September and they're going to keep monitoring as they're moving forward. Um, what that really says for us is, you know, we're really having to look at our plans and how we manage um, our operations because we haven't, we know we have an, a number of staff members who have kids um, and how is that going to impact it and ensuring that they can be online and learning. Um, many of the conversations that, that, that came up that I heard earlier about childcare, that is a major, um, or that is a focus for us as we're looking at what the world's going to be um, for us moving forward and childcare is a, is a big component of that. We um, conducted a survey where we sent that out to our early childhood care providers to see who's still continuing to provide child care, who's not providing, what are the limitations, what are your struggles financially, uh, because we're trying to get a sense of what that world really looks like, um, because as we look at our CARES funding, that's an opportunity to help um, stabilize that world a little bit. And, and it's all encompassing when we talk about the child care um, piece to this, because it's not only about child care for um, teachers, but it's also those parents that have to work, and how do we assure that there's enough spots, and, and we're definitely seeing issues. Um, anecdotally, and hopefully the survey will clarify some of this, the, the friends and family network has been something that we've been concerned about because most of that's in people's homes and they don't want to do that because of obvious reasons. So there's a lot of issues we're trying to wrap our hands around at the moment. And as we look at the CARES funding that we received, hopefully within a week or so, we'll be able to um, have a sense of what that's going to look like and, and, and how we're going to at least make recommendations to council in terms of applying that to our community and our operations. Um, so that's a that's a piece that's going to be come to, coming to you all hopefully in the very near future. Um, I mentioned CARES funding. What we're also looking at is in terms of some of the expenses that we've absorbed as an organization um, that were not planned. Um, PPE purchases, equipment purchases to sanitize vehicles. I mean, we had a lot of things that we had to bring in. So um, we have, we are really fortunate in our organization to have two outstanding individuals that do this work, Peter Gibbons, and, and I always forget Charlie's name, but I call him FEMA Charlie, um, to work us through all of the FEMA processes and, um, and, and all of these funding mechanisms that are coming to play in addition to Kathy and her team and the CDBG CV funding um, to really look at how do we apply it? How are we covering gaps? How are we working through some of the issues that we're, that we're seeing as a community? Um, and I will say the, the thing that I said on a number of occasions is child care is, it is, has the potential to have an economic development impact on our community. Um, and so those are the things that, um, you know, we're gonna be looking at, hopefully have something to you in the near future on that piece and what that's gonna look like to our organization. At the same time, um, we're preparing the budget based on this. And again, I will remind you, we're looking at this on a month to month basis um, because of, of, of how fast things changes and the impact of certain decisions. Um, so we're um, continuing to dig into that so we can have that ready by the time that our charter requires it. Well, we will have it to you on September 1st, but it's um, you know just taking a lot of time from Jim and his staff and trying to reconcile that versus what the world of COVID is going to look like and how it's going to impact our operations next year. And that's the big piece. It's, you know, we're, we're having to um, make really educated guesses in terms of what do we think next year is going to look like as we're putting this budget together. That's my update. If you all have any questions, I can answer those. Councilmember Peck. 
Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Harold, just as a point of clarification, you may have already said this and I've forgotten. When you do the five day, uh, what did you call it? Just five day look at the cases um, and you come up with a percentage. For example, it was about 3%. Is that based on, a, on our population? And it's based on the number of tests. And okay. so we don't do that. The health department does it. So they take the number of tests that are performed and then how many of those tests are positive and that gets you to that percentage. And, and what that does is it really starts giving you a sense of, of how fast it's moving in within communities, within counties and within states. And so what you're hearing in some of the other cases, and this is why I say we have to really watch the Y axis. Um, if you watch certain national news, you'll see Colorado where it says significant increase. Well, that's a percentage point. And, but we have much lower cases, so we may not see the case growth that some of the other states are having in that. So this is a percentage of that, and that's what we watch, which then goes into how they calculate the r naught, which is how infectious it is, in addition to how well people are wearing masks and following all of the orders to develop their other models. Yeah, I'm sorry, I broke in there. Um, just out of curiosity, I how many people were actually tested within that time frame in Longmont so that we can see how many negative cases, uh, negative tests came out of that? I'd be curious to see, see what that looked like. I mean, 3% of how many cases were tested, which would tell us how many were actually negative. Um, I so don't we, can we, we can try to get that information. Let me share the screen with you right now. Okay, because I don't know what's 3% of what. So in this case, um, really? so in this case, they had about, uh, let's say 450 tests performed. Um, okay. So then you had about 460, then you had 500. Uh, oh, and then you can okay. see, you can see that then they dropped and then they went up to 520 on this date. So um, generally, it's in that range of out of 500 tests. So that's out of 500 tests. That's the 3%. And I'm just so taking me, a percentage that was uh, positive. So they so right here on this chart, they've, uh -huh. they've conducted 30,967 tests. In what time? This is over the course of the entire okay. event. Um, overall, it's 5%, uh, but the current five-day average is 3.2%. Okay. So that's when then you look at the last five days to figure out how many tests they've done. And if you remember what um, Jeff Zayak said when he presented, and we're going to try to get him back again. Um, what they really wanted to do is that study said having the ability to do 500 tests when, right. when you could get there. And they've obviously exceeded that on certain days. Okay, thank you for re restating that. No problem. All right, Councilman Rivago Firing. Um, so you and I have had conversations, and I also spoke with Jeff um, Zayak about this, but that period where we had that 17% positivity rate, mm -hmm. so in our conversations, so we think about early in the pandemic, it right. was, um, you know, really you were kind of on death do death's doorstep before you could even access a test. Correct. They were turning a lot of people away. Um, so that rate then impact, impacted the overall. So I know Correct. I've had conversations with several educators because I think, I don't, was it two weeks ago that it was even up to 5.7%? Maybe for the state. For the state, okay. I don't, I don't think it's Boulder County we've been there, but the state, um, let me pull that up. So, um. Yeah, on July 22nd, 2020, the state positivity rate was at 5.84%. 5.84%. Okay, so that's what I was thinking, but it was looking at the whole um, duration of the pandemic. So that's why the 5% overall rate is a little higher than that 3.2%. 2%, correct. And um, 
Okay, yeah, and thanks for clarifying that. The other question I had was around um, licensing for daycare. Is there any work about maybe expediting that process for people who want to? I know I've heard um, community members and parents talking about wanting to create these pods where they would still have, so they'd have multiple children in their home, but still utilizing the district's um, curric you know, curriculum. So we would still have, be teaching, but the fact that they would be having multiple families in their homes, I, that kind of, for me, that raised a red flag as far as licensures. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but um, I know we can get with Jeff and, and Karen and Christina to try to get the answer to that because one of the things we've asked Jeff Friesner to do, if you remember early on, we were, we were spinning up some child care opportunities within our organization because of what we were seeing and the need for child care for healthcare professionals and what we needed. And so I've asked them to look at the same thing um, as we get into the fall in case there are gaps or shortages. But, you know, we've done some things now where they're, we're helping facilitate PPP, PPE through our system because of the bulk purchasing um, that, that we have at play in play to, to hopefully reduce some of those expenses. So we're, we're doing a number of things and, and hopefully when we can bring that CARES funding piece, you'll see it all be where we're tying it together. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. All right. Seeing nobody else. Harold, do you have anything uh, else? I've got David Bell for all a right. quick presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. David Bell, Director of Parks and Natural Resources. This is a, a follow-up conversation, and I, I know you got a lot of stuff on the agenda tonight, so I'll try to keep it brief, um, but we'll definitely make myself available for questions here or even afterwards. You always can reach out to me, but um, on the 14th, we hit some highlights of what we were seeing in the parks, and I had a chance to hear from Council Members and the public about some other items they wanted to discuss. So I want to make sure that what I heard from Council and what I'm hearing from the public is aligning with what you're hearing out there as well. And this is also a chance for you to hear what we're doing in response um, to some of the things we're seeing in the parks because of that increased use. And again, I, I just wanted to remind everyone that this is an increased use, not only in Longmont, not only in Boulder County, but nationwide as people are really trying to take the opportunity to get out of the house that people that may have been uncomfortable going to restaurants or theaters or, or movies are, are really taking advantage of being outside and enjoying these outdoor opportunities. So we definitely are seeing um, an increase in use which again, I think has some very positive aspects, but also has some impacts on our community and the resources. So I, I, I'm not sure who is going to run this PowerPoint or how I do that, Harold. I, was, I sent it to Susan. Sorry, David, just one second. You're fine, thank you. All right, I'm advanced. Let me go back. My apologies, David. Start start talking. I, I have my other thought was, can I share my screen? Hey, Don, let me give it a try. Okay. Ready when you are. All right. 
Um, again, this is that follow up and really what we, as long as other um, natural resource agencies are, are seeing around the front range in the country as we're trying to manage um, our parks and natural areas during this pandemic. Next slide. So I think you've all seen kind of what that impact is. It's hot, kids weren't in school. Um, how do we get out and do things? So um, from Dickens Park to Left Hand Creek to McIntosh and um, the bridge down at Dickens as well. Button Rock is included in that as areas that were really impacted pretty significantly. And we had to respond pretty quickly on how we um, wanted to engage in making sure people are acting in a safe way, following our rules and regulations as well as um, trying to keep them safe following the governor's guidelines. Next slide. So what we were really seeing out there that were probably some of our biggest concerns, and again, this is a place I'm hoping if council see things on here that they are not, are, seeing, are not seeing things on here that they want us to make sure that we hear about, please let, let me know. But um, swimming, especially out at, Mac and, at Macintosh. We're seeing single chamber inflatable inner tubes that don't really have safety features on them. We're seeing increased number of watercraft at Macintosh. Um, launching from undesignated launch areas, which causes impacts. Dogs off leash, littering, um, alcohol and glass as you start bringing these large groups of people together. Next slide. And with those violations, those rules and regs, um, we definitely know that those rules and regs are there for a purpose and a lot of that is safety. Um, at McIntosh, we really have no lifeguards on duty. We don't have water rescue. We don't have any way to water, uh, monitor the quality of the water. So we don't know what um, E. coli is for um, instance, where we do that at Union Reservoir. We have impacts to habitat. Um, we have shoreline degradation, um, trash is getting very full and um, neighborhoods are being impacted. We're seeing parking that has, you know, become something that people are not used to in neighborhoods. And we also have the ongoing concern about people not wearing masks in our parks and large groups gathering. And that, next slide. And just the way this is on my screen now, I apologize. I can't see any of the council members. So I'm, I'm hoping if you have questions or if you see things that are out of line with what you're hearing, just please let me know. And I hope I'll, I'll hear your voice. We'll get it at the end, David. Okay, very good. Um, so in, the, in a typical time, what we'd be doing is saying we have tools in our toolbox that can help us get through this. And we've kind of put this together as kind of spokes on a wheel, how these things work together to help us um, keep our park system rolling along smoothly. So we have signs, we have rules and regs, we have educations, we have presence, we have enforcement. Um, but all those things take resources that are based on our um, previous usage in our park. So now what do we do to make sure that tool component of the spokes that are working well? So next slide. Um, we have really tapped into our, our park rangers. Um, we have um, three of them out at Union Reservoir full time. And as you can imagine, Union has become very busy. They have done a great job out there of limiting the number of visitors, opening the swim beach now to 75 people, opening the dog beach, all those um, activities require rangers to be there to make sure they're doing that. Um, plus getting out and then trying to be out at um, Dickens Park and Macintosh. So we're, we're, we're taxing that group, but we are using them as part of the, the tools. Um, transportation has been out looking at the streets. They've been looking at parking. They've been working with us on getting speed signs up to make sure that we're addressing that. Our solid waste group has put dumpsters out at Dickens so that we can um, address that increase in trash. Parks maintenance has been just doing a great job as they um, try to keep the parks clean, but also deal with our ir irrigation and turf and and social trails. Um, we have parks um, staff that's coming on the weekends now um, just to do trash because we used to kind of hold over until Monday to clean it up and it was taking a full day just to deal with that trash. So we're, we're dealing with trash with the additional existing staff that's getting overtime. Um, our parks development crew is making temporary signs and heading out on the weekends um, using their household child labor and on bike tours to make sure we're putting our signs up. Um, our communications team is working with to make sure as we're making changes at our swim beach from being closed to open to 50 to 75 to letting people know jumping off bridges is not safe. They've really stepped up to help us out. And then um, Dan Wolford and the land management group, they've done a great job of being at the button rock to help with that staffing, um, being out monitoring our wildlife areas to help me know when we need to do things like install um, the, the buoys out at McIntosh. Next slide. 
but we couldn't do it ourselves. And that's just a piece that we've had to really reach out and ask for help. And again, as you know, Harold's, Harold's, Harold's already talked budget. Um, it's a time that some of these things we'd be going back and going to Harold and council and say, we, we need some additional funds to deal with this additional use. But um, we've had code enforcements out there. They call me, ask me what the chains are as far as are we allowing people in skate parks? Are we now allowing people um, in the parks if there's RVs in the parks? So code enforcement stepped up. Dispatch is trying to answer a lot of these ongoing questions um, so they don't come back to staff that has to deal with them, try to give public help with good information. Public Safety and Jeff's group have just done an exceptional job of giving us additional resources where we could do um, additional patrols at Dickens, at McIntosh, at Union, and then assigning officers up to Button Rock as well. Um, and I, I just can't tell you what a great partnership that's been. I think it's worked out well for the Rangers who know they're short. The public is one of those things I think that um, they are get a chance to get out and engage with people. And I, I think they're really being appreciated out there as people are trying to do the right thing and having someone to turn to ask for how they um, are supposed to be social distancing, how they can park, how they do things right. And people are really looking to try to do things right. Having those officers there, I think has made a difference. Social media, again, from um, Harold's group and Marika, they've done a great job helping us. Um, Jeff Friesner and the recreation group has provided people on weekends to go to McIntosh, talk about social distancing, talk about um, not swimming in the lake and some of the challenges that people might face if they are in that water that's not tested goes beyond just the city support. And that's why um, I went to agency support. Lions, I was on a call today and no one can find um, the variable message boards and once you can kind of program in what your, your message is before you get there. Lions has given us the ability to use their signs. So as people come into Lions, they get a message that Button Rock parking lot um, may be full. So people get that message before they get up there and have to make a decision. Boulder Sound County um, has given us very quickly um, the ability to post County Road 80 with no parking signs to help the neighbors up there um, and then provided the signage for that too. So this really has taken a, a large group beyond what um, PWNRSAP has already um, been putting out there. Next slide. The other piece is the, the community support and it's something that some of the council members have brought up at the last meeting and why can't we use volunteers and I, I share some of my concerns right now. Um, People are willing to ask for help, but I think when you start telling people what they can't do right now, we, we're definitely getting pushback. Um, but after that meeting, I had members of our community calling saying, you know what, you guys are doing a great job. We understand this is challenging. What can we do to help? So knowing we have people there, knowing what our challenges are, um, we've been starting to put together a training program to do some um, work in our parks. Boulder County has done a program called Park Ambassadors. We're also looking at using them just to collect data so that council has a better idea how many people are seeing, how big groups are, what's parking's like, so they can balance what we're getting from staff, from the community, and from neighbors with what we're seeing from some data that we're collecting. How quickly we get that and how statistically valid will be over the next couple of weeks or months, um, we'll take a little looking at, but again, utilizing um, people to help us gather that information. Um, they're also great using social media to help uh, push the city's causes through their, their social media networks. Neighbors, um, if it's the neighbor calling and seeing something, the neighbor is having a problem, those are those extra eyes and ears for us. And we always take those very seriously and try to respond and try to make sure that that information is being captured as well. Um, so our neighbors are great, as well as our park users. Um, one of the things we can do, I think for me, the biggest concerns are always the, the safety concerns. And um, if it's kids jumping off bridges or people swimming Macintosh, it's the park users that are really getting on their phones and letting us know that those things are happening. So. Um, the community has been a big part of this as well. Next slide. So I think with, with staff being out there, and this is Macintosh, this is a Saturday. Um, if you'd ask, I, I believe Jeff's group is going out there, recreation is going out there, my staff is going out there, and you say, what are you seeing? I would definitely say we are seeing busy parks. Next slide. Um, people are getting out, they're taking advantage of our outdoors, the amenities we built. Um, and this is the piece that goes back to the, the COVID and how that, the ability to use these spaces to um, have opportunities, but also how we're not increasing spread, um, how we're keeping people safe in their own social groups is um, a little more challenging. As we go out there, we see busy parks. We see a lot of groups of people that are 
isolate themselves from other groups. So once they're in those groups, then if it's the same household, um, they don't have to have a mask. However, we are not going out this time to make sure council is aware and, and asking people you're in the same household. Um, even if you were checked for IDs, um, one of the, it could be a group of sorority women that are up here and they're living in the same household, but they don't have the same address. It could be a family um, who lives in different households or all lives in the same house, but they have kids in college and they're coming back. So those, those IDs don't even always match up or give us a good way to know the people in the household. So what we're really looking for is the ability for people to go out, find a space where they can keep their six foot distancing, where them and their group are not impacted by another user group. Um, they can use that infrastructure we provided and, and do it in a safe way by making decisions for themselves. So um, we are still working with this. You can go to the next slide, slide please. Um, however, it's the piece that, you know, resources that we, we know we, we really could use to do a better job. I think we've shared with council that we only have three park rangers out at Union right now. We are in the hiring process for two more at Button Rock, which would be a huge benefit. Um, we're working on building that volunteer program, which again, takes a, it takes time to make sure people are trained appropriately. I mentioned it prior to this, that when we put people out there um, with a Longmont uniform on or a Longmont clipboard and a Longmont name tag that they're representing the city we want to make sure that they're doing a way that represents the city's philosophies but also keeps them safe and the people they're contacting safe um, signage we've been doing low low um, costs making laminate signs putting them up things like no swimming at mcintosh they're temporary they blow down they get tore down takes labor takes time um, but we're working on that um, we're also looking at volunteers to help us put those signs up and keep up on that um, if we want to start looking at mid-range signs that we can just kind of do a quick go to the sign shop, we're looking like $11,000. Um, if we want to do full sign package at a place like Macintosh, uh, you're looking at about $82,000. One of the things we're also working with, and um, Harold already gave them a shout out, but Peter Gibbons and the group looking at some of the grants that are out there. GoCo is offering some stuff now to help agencies respond to this. And one of the things that can be covered are things like rangers and signs. So we are, we're racing deadlines to get some grants in um, to help us meet those funding needs. Um, Harold and Dale have been great saying, how can we work internally to look at using recreation, using PD, using people um, whose jobs may not be fully um, utilized right now. So I think that creative piece with grants are, are a great way for us to keep moving forward. Next slide. So it really does take all these pieces working together Knowing that we don't have, you know, just a, a deep well to go to to do this, I, I think we are going to continue to work collaboratively to strengthen um, all those folks so that we can continue, continue by this um, experience for our, our community. And I'll just go back to, I think, all the groups I get on the phone with, our Zoom calls, it's just as professional. I think we recognize how important keeping these spaces open to the public is for their mental and physical health. So health so that we're, we're really doing everything we can to make sure we provide a space that um, is safe as possible while protecting our natural resources so they're not impacted for next season or next generations. Next slide. And that's my quick update. And again, I know I think you probably heard a lot of this already, but um, I really wanna make sure that what you're hearing from your constituents is lining up with what we're hearing and also um, if there's things that we're doing that you're unaware of or have questions about, please let me know. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. Uh, David, I wanted to thank you very much for this presentation as well as for um, the volunteer education part. Whenever, whenever we have something that we need help with involving the community, brings us together, whether it's a flood, whether it's a pandemic, whether it, and they want to help. So I thank you very much for doing that. Um, and I was out at Macintosh this weekend and people, people are better. There was, there was absolutely no parking on the, on the street that is um, right next to Macintosh. I don't, I don't sure. remember. Lake Shore, is that Lakeshore? Yes. Um, they were finding other places to park. I think that the word is getting out that everybody has to be responsible. There are still some kids taking their unsafe rafts out and then pretending like they fell off when actually they're diving into the water. Um, but I do want the public to know that these are public parks. Just because you live by one, 
does not mean it is specifically for you. The entire city has access to all our public parks. And um, I am happy that we have all these parks during this uh, ridiculous, surreal time. So um, thank you for all your work and let us know how we can help you. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to soapbox for just a minute because I, I think you did a piece that I think me and my staff have really talked about. And as we look at um, kind of the social equity piece where people that don't have backyards, they don't have a green space, they don't have anything other than our than our parks, I, I really think that these are important spaces for our whole community. I, I know it can be a very, it can be a challenge for the neighbor who lived there and wasn't used to this. I think it's a opportunity to try to engage in that, but that conversation, but I, you're right. I, I think having these parks out there for the whole community is something we all have to understand. I think the thing I would add to what David said just real quick is this is, um, an extreme exercise for us in, in social engagement with individuals based on what we're seeing and how they approach it. Um, and and, and there's, there's just a lot of people management. And we're constantly getting these calls. Um, I had one, a text of a picture where we actually had some teenagers on top of one of our water buildings at one of our parks, um, and they were suntanning and eating food. And so how we work together is it comes in, I call Jeff Satter, Jeff gets someone, but by the time they get there, they're gone. Um, and, and so what people, I think what I would like the community to understand is we're seeing it and we're hearing it. But in many cases, by the time we can actually get someone there, whatever people are doing, they're not doing it anymore. And, and the thing I would say to everyone, and, and I've even said this to my staff, educate, don't enforce because we know what some of the, re the interactions have been like. And if, it, and if we're gonna go there, then we need to contact the appropriate people because we, we've seen the bad side of some of these interactions. Um, and that's why I wanna be very cautious with everyone um, because there's times when it's been pretty tough for our staff and when they've engaged in those conversations. All right. Um, then thank you very much. I echoed uh, Councilmember Peck's uh, appreciation for the report and the update. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All, all right. Harold, is that it? What's okay. it? All right, cool. Let's move on and invite, is Jessica Erickson here? Who's, who's joining us from her group? I'm here. Jessica. All right, I Jessica, am the group right now. <laughs> you, you are the group. All right, let's go ahead and welcome you and hear your, your presentation, please. Great. Thank you, Mayor Bagley and council members. I will let you know that uh, um, Harold has given me a strict, I believe, seven minutes to um, do my presentation this evening, understanding uh, the length of your agenda tonight. And so I'll, I'll do my best to stick within that, if not uh, fall below. And so with that, those time limitations, you've been provided my report in advance in your packet. I'm not gonna go through every metric and ev every objective as I've done at some times in the past, and um, I've just pulled out some highlights, um, some sections where I think there, I might be able to answer questions before they're asked, but I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, regarding any portion of the report that you were provided or the presentation, the pieces of that that I'll be presenting tonight. And um, I don't know who's running my presentation. I see it. We can go to the next slide. You can just go to the next slide. So just to remind you that our contract with you as well as our work plan is aligned with the focus areas of Advanced One What 2.0 of talent, connectivity, place, impact, and industry. Uh, provide you an update on Advanced One What 2.0. You'll recall we did suspend the working groups in the early days of the pandemic so that we could focus our efforts on the business response team and partnership with other advanced on partner organizations. We have reconvened all of the working groups, um, all of the active working groups uh, over the course of the last month, really to look at a review of the pre-COVID initiatives, whether or not they were still relevant and how timely they were um, in a COVID world or in the midst of, of, of the COVID pandemic. And so we're updating the, those work plans. I say we, uh, but many of you, or if not all of you, have probably heard that Morgan is no longer with the organization. His last day was July 31st, 
Um, he's gone on to pursue his entrepreneurial dreams uh, with a, um, a business that he and his father started. And so um, we are without a leader for Advance on 1.2.0, but hopefully very briefly as we'll be posting a position for a collective impact coordinator. So somebody whose job it will be um, to come in and take the baton um, from Morgan, uh, who will help onboard that person to really uh, support the work of Advance on Web 2.0. And we, so we hope to have that person in place by uh, September. And then uh, we can go to the next slide. So our work plan at Longmont EDP is really focused on three areas of Advance on Web 2.0, as is our contract with uh, the city of Longmont. And those are talent, industry, and impact. If you go to the next slide, I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that are in your report. Or, sorry, we can go to the next slide. I got seven minutes here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so starting with talent at the Advanced Long Want 2.0 goal around talent is to successfully recruit and retain new needed talent while building an industry and future responsive pipeline. I'm gonna focus mostly on the first part of that, which is our efforts to recruit and retain new needed talent. Next slide. We have officially launched our national marketing campaign, one component of that being a talent attraction campaign. We are actually putting um, advertising as well as media, so owned, earned, and um, paid media into target markets that are either producing or have a high concentration of the talent that's specifically needed by our industry base here. We actually talked to industry here in Longmont, um, in particular our leadership council who invested in this campaign, um, to find out what their skills and talent needs are. And we're targeting markets that are, again, either producing through their university systems or already have high concentrations because of their industry, con industry concentrations of that talent and making the case for Longmont as both a place where you can have the lifestyle that you want as well as uh, career advancement opportunities within those industries, um, our targeted industries in particular. Go to the next slide. One of our um, metrics in, uh, in the contract with the city is to develop KPIs around that campaign. And so I shared with you in the report what those KPIs are. Um, even though this is technically third quarter stuff, wanted to share with you some of the early results that we're reporting against those KPIs. So we, ha um, having launched that campaign in the first part of July, uh, have already driven to over 2,700 new users to our website. And if you can scroll down a little bit, you can see the age breakdown um, being really that 25 to 54 age range with a consistent uptick in both uh, monthly, and user, monthly and weekly users since we began the campaign. We'll continue to report out on those. I just wanted to show you some of the early results and to remind you too that the, this campaign or this part of the campaign is really a top of funnel awareness campaign. And so we will ultimately, especially as it relates to the portion of that that is to attract industry and business investment, we'll have some future KPIs on conversion of that activity into actual relocation of talent and actual um, business and industry investment and job creation in our community. We're just setting a baseline now because it's the first time we've done a campaign like this for a long time. Next slide. Uh, we have done some paid social advertising, um, Facebook impressions on those advertisements, over 380,000 impressions of which, um, and 2,700 clicks, of which Boston, interestingly, makes up about a third of the total clicks. So people looking to relocate and hear, hear from Boston, I think that not an accident um, when we look at the industry concentration and talent and uh, the drive of uh, people in the midst of the pandemic to get out of those more highly dense um, environments into places where they can still have career advancement opportunities, but a more um, uh, relaxed lifestyle and a more spread out lifestyle than what they might have in areas like Boston and the Bay Area, which are two of our targeted areas. LinkedIn, interestingly, um, uh, we've seen most of our act activity coming out of Portland. So 24% per, uh, of impressions um, coming from Portland. And I have no theory on that. Portland and um, Denver metro area are often um, competitive in terms of both business location and talent location. Um, and so we'll continue to watch if that um, remains consistent over time. So moving forward. I also wanted to um, uh, update you that we did finally launch the Longmont Start to Home program. I'll remind you, we started talking about this last year 
as a talent relocation program. Uh, so a tool for our existing industry base and newly relocating companies to use to help attract talent or convince talent to relocate as part of a relocation of a company. Post pandemic, we actually have been able to work with our partners at Cornerstone Home Lending uh, to pivot that to allow for it to be used also for existing Longmont based employees who are either um, seeking to move out of rentals or even just move across town um, and purchase a home or uh, in some cases refinance, which becomes incredibly important, important um, as part of economic recovery for individuals um, uh, during and post pandemic. Next. All right, and in this quick industry update, um, again, the goal, primary local and startup companies uh, th um, in Longmont thrive with a collaborative business environment and easy access to financing, real estate and mentorship. Going forward, next slide. Um, just provided uh, some more detailed information about our prospect pipeline. We still have a very active pipeline with 29 total uh, primary industry prospects that we've worked with year to date. Uh, 17 of those having come in new in 2020, some of those even in June and early July, um, with over 7,000 jobs in that pipeline. So if we were to win all 29 of those prospects, um, we would be uh, creating over 7,600 jobs. The most interesting piece of this that I wanted to share with you is the real estate demand by square feet needed by those prospects. Nearly half of those prospects are companies that are looking for in excess of 100,000 square feet. And so other than the Max facility and uh, one other facility at Dry Creek right now, and then ultimately the GE facility, for existing space, we don't have a lot of big block 100,000 square foot existing space. So in order to accommodate future users of that size, which it seems to be where we're getting a lot of interest, um, especially in recent weeks and months, uh, is in with those larger users. Uh, we are having ongoing conversations with um, our development community, as well as our landowner community to talk about how we at least get site shovel ready to be able to provide build a suit options for um, some of those uh, prospects as they're coming to us. We're also gonna be partnering with the Longmont Downtown Development Authority to do a citywide real estate uh, office and industrial real estate market assessment to understand uh, in a COVID world, what our baseline is, what some of the challenges and opportunities we'll be facing. Um, certainly, I wouldn't have anticipated that we'd suddenly get a bunch of 100,000 plus to 300,000 square foot users that were interested in Longmont. So we'd like to better understand what those dynamics are, how we take advantage of them, and also ensure um, that uh, we're attracting and um, incentivizing potentially uh, those businesses, especially of that size, that match our, our values as a community. So going to the next slide. And just also wanted to point out that another component of our national marketing campaign is the traditional business attraction, economic development, messaging to site selection and corporate real estate decision makers across the country. Again, targeting those regions nationally that have concentrations of um, our targeted industries that may have an interest uh, to expand or relocate into Longmont. Next slide. And then for entrepreneurial development, just wanted to brag on the Innovate Longmont program. That's the accelerator program that spun out of Longmont EDP earlier this year, um, founded in Longmont EDP in 2018. Seven startups have now completed the first Innovate Accelerator cohort. Um, one of those startups did re, was awarded recently a $250,000 Colorado Advanced Industries Accelerator Grant. And then Winter Winds Robotics, another one of those startups, uh, robotics, um, uh, aerospace robotics company, has uh, expanded into about 1,000 square feet of our space because we wanted to make sure we could continue to accommodate them here in Longmont. So we gave up some of our space to do so. Uh, they now have been awarded a phase one SBIR, are pursuing a phase two SBIR, and have been awarded a NASA contract to get uh, their robotic arm onto uh, air, uh, spacecraft that will actually um, be part of future launch. Um, so we're excited about them. And they're now actually employing uh, 15 people having launched out of our Innovate Longmont Accelerator in November of last year. And uh, I believe profitable, um, not certain on that, but definitely generating revenue already, significant revenue already. Uh, the, the Accelerator has pivoted to a fully online platform, so they're going to test that out for the second cohort, which will launch in fall of 2020, and applications are now open for that. 
And then in the interest of time, we'll go to the next slide and talk about impact. Um, our goal here being to be nationally recognized that as a city that solve problems, solves problems together, uniting organizations, resources, and people from all sectors to implement what matters. And this of course is more important now in a COVID world than it ever has been before. But just wanted to point out that this advanced loan want 2.0 strategy having launched it when we did. Uh, certainly we weren't prepared for or anticipating global pandemic, but I think that we have a head start in terms of recovery and resilience for our community because we were already had this collective impact model where we were already talking about and actively aligning resources um, and goals and working together on more strategic initiatives um, that matter, but now uh, using that same strategy to address the problems and the challenges that have come with COVID and the pandemic. So our Aspire Leadership Council has been very active in helping us to de develop some policy recommendations. We're actually using, leveraging that Leadership Council um, to support the conversation around uh, early childhood education and daycare and what industry's role can be in addressing that challenge for our community. Um, we're also working with Visit Longmont, Chamber of Commerce, um, and uh, the Downtown Development Authority to better align our resources around marketing. Um, also in an effort to lift up Visit Longmont as, they, as they've struggled most significantly from an organization financing perspective uh, because of the loss of lodging tax revenue. So to keep that, help keep that organization alive as well as align and better share resources across organizations is something that I can't envision would have happened pre-advanced Longmont 2.0 under the same circumstances, but because we were already of that mindset, of that collective impact mindset, we've been very quickly able to uh, put together a strategy to address just such circumstances. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions that you have. All right, I don't see any questions, but Jessica, thank you very much for your presentation and we appreciate the work you do. And uh, do you have any, uh, next time we expect a picture of that new baby? No, I have plenty of those. All I'll just right. give a slide show, slide show of baby pictures. Next yeah, time. well, next time, at least one slide with the baby picture, please. Okay. All right? All right. All right. Cool. Later. All right, let's move on to mayor and council come. Just kidding. We're not done. All right, let's go on to study, study, uh, study session item number 16A, Resilient State Brain Project Update. Uh, Mayor Bagley and members of council, I'm going to start that presentation off if uh, Don can start the slideshow. Um, tonight uh, at your study session, this is really to give you an update on the status of the Resilient St. Marine program and project. Uh, council, you know we have been underway with this project literally for uh, going on seven years now uh, since the September 2013 flood. Um, it has been a uh, it has been an interesting project. It, it, it's one that I really do believe has brought the community together uh, around a common and shared goal and purpose to protect people and property uh, in times of flood. And I'm um, very proud of the staff that has been involved with this project. And, and most importantly, uh, of course, Nick Wolfram, who uh, seemed like a long time ago, used to be our uh, director of engineering. And Nick is still with us. Uh, working uh, hand in hand with Josh Sherman, who is our senior engineer that's going to make the presentation tonight. A couple of things I want council to um, to take away from this presentation. One is, is that uh, uh, we're going to provide some information on the upcoming Army Corps project. And most importantly, um, we are going to have, uh, we have the contract ready for your consideration. Uh, at your August 11th meeting. And so tonight is really a good opportunity to ask questions about that particular aspect of the project. And that uh, we wanted to give you an update as well on the additional federal dollars that we are trying to bring into the community, uh, in particular for the unfunded reach of the project that is upstream of Sunset. And so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Josh Sherman uh, to take us through the presentation. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Dale. Uh, next slide, please, Don. Thank you. So as Dale mentioned, um, the Resilient St. Vrain uh, project was initiated after the September 2013 flood event. 
It's the city's multi-year, multi-phase project to fully restore the St. Brain Greenway Trail, improve the St. Brain Creek Channel to protect people, property, and infrastructure from future flood risks. <clears throat> and one of the project's goals is to incorporate natural channel design and techniques where feasible and uh, complete the work in an environmentally sensitive way. I think of RSVP as a master plan for St. Brain Creek. And again, the extent of this project um, begin on the downstream side at the confluence of St. Brain Creek and Boulder Creek out at Sandstone Ranch on the east end of the city. And they work all the way upstream to the west end of the city at Airport Road. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the agenda that we wanna get through tonight is to provide a status update on the project. The presentation will follow uh, the phasing of the project improvements by starting on the downstream side and work upstream. The, the project has been segmented into reaches or phases um, that are being completed based on the funding availability. And <clears throat> this highlight, like Dale meant, uh, this presentation, like Dale mentioned, will highlight some of the work that's complete, some of the work that's currently under construction, where we are with final design and uh, pending work, and finally, where we are headed with some of the future phases. Um, next slide. This graphic just provides an illustration of uh, the reaches that we're gonna speak to tonight. In yellow is City Reach 1. Again, it begins on the downstream side uh, at Left Hand Creek in the city's wastewater treatment plant and ends at Main Street. That work is complete. Uh, the area in red is we, we refer to as City Reach 2A. Begins at Main Street and works upstream west of South Pratt Parkway. Um, of course, the South Pratt Parkway Bridge and Main Street Bridge have also been replaced in coordination um, with the project and to pass the new flood flows. <clears throat> the area in green is referred to as City Reach 2B. It includes channel improvements immediately upstream and downstream of the BNSF Railroad Bridge and includes replacement of that structure. That is a project that's currently under construction. Uh, further upstream is a short section in blue that we refer to as Isaac Walton Reach 1. Extends from Price Road up to Boston Avenue. It's a very confined section of the, of the channel. And then moving further upstream <clears throat> in the magenta is what we refer to as Isaac Walton Reach 2. It's an area that we've been working on with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, through a feasibility study and that we are planning to advance towards final design. That project also includes replacement of the Boston Avenue Bridge on the downstream side. And then finally, um, upstream from South Sunset Street, we refer to as uh, City Reach 3 from Sunset all the way out to Airport Road. We would anticipate um, completing that project in phases because it's currently unfunded and looking at the initial phase of the Hover Road Reach from Sunset up to Hover Road. So next slide, please. <clears throat> we have a short three minute video to share and while Don and, and Susan are maybe queuing that up, I can set the stage. Um, this is an aerial video that starts at the downstream end of the project near Left Hand Creek at, in the city's wastewater treatment plant and moves upstream to uh, where work is currently underway at the BNSF Railroad Bridge. I want to give a quick thank you to the Longmont Police Department for providing a drone and a pilot to fly this section of the creek and to the city's public information team for editing and putting together this video. So with that, we can start the video. Are you hearing this? I am not, but it's just um, elevator music to the background <laughs> of the video. Thank you. 
Perfect, thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, to continue and to highlight some of, again, some of the work that's been done, City Reach 1 and City Reach 2A are projects that are both complete. Um, in coordination with those, the Dickens Farm Nature Area was also recently completed um, earlier this year. And as David mentioned in a previous presentation tonight, um, that's an area where the public can, uh, is invited to and can interact with the water in the creek, and it's proven to be very popular. Um, City Reach 1 and City Reach 2A, as a reminder, were primarily funded through the FEMA Public Assistance Alternative Procedures Funding, the PAP program, um, as well as local, uh, local dollars. And then adjacent to those reaches, the Main Street Bridge and South Pratt Parkway Bridge, which were both separate transportation capital improvement programs or projects um, have also been replaced and, and now have the capacity to pass the larger uh, new storm flows. Um, <clears throat> a couple of accolades that the project has received, uh, an APWA, American Public Works Association, Colorado Chapter Award for Sustainability in the Large Community category. And then uh, recently, I just learned that uh, one of our funding partners, FEMA, has been referencing the Resilient St. Brain project as an example for good mitigation projects that implement resilient infrastructure and nature-based flood protection. So we're humbled to get that recognition. Uh, next slide, please. So one, with the work that's been completed, the, the city is going to initiate a letter of map revision. And this slide illustrates the benefits uh, and floodplain improvements for the projects completed to date. Uh, the area in blue shown on the screen is the 100-year floodplain. And on this map are some uh, tributaries to St. Brain Creek as well, such as Left Hand Creek and, and Spring Gulch Number 1. Um, the areas in, in the black crosshatch are properties and, uh, and, and structures that have been removed from the 100-year floodplain as a result of uh, the project improvements completed to date. So some of those areas that are being highlighted, such as the city's wastewater treatment plant facility are now protected. Um, some commercial and residential properties south of the creek adjacent to Main Street and South Pratt Parkway. Um, and so again, we'll be initiating a, a letter of map revision, which is the steps that are necessary to actually have the floodplain maps reflect those benefits. <clears throat> um, not all the property adjacent to those reaches have been removed from the 100 year floodplain. And that's because the project needs to continue further upstream to cut off some of the out-of-bank flooding that's shown on this map and represented as uh, the St. Brain Creek, Isaac Walton split flow. And so we'll get into that as we continue to move forward. Uh, next slide, please. City Reach 2B was at the end of the video there that was uh, currently under construction. And again, it's the channel improvements immediately upstream and downstream of the BNSF railroad crossing and includes a replacement of that bridge as well as replacement of the uh, Price Road pedestrian bridge at that location. Uh, that project is scheduled to be substantially complete in uh, December of this year. Um, the, uh, the railroad bridge has been replaced and the picture on the top right is a, a BNSF train running over um, that new structure. The contractor is out there this week excavating the new channel underneath that new bridge. This project um, removes a, a dog leg and a, and a major constriction on the, on the creek, which was the old railroad bridge, and uh, will result in additional floodplain benefits. And so the city would initiate uh, un, plans to initiate another floodplain remapping uh, a letter of map revision number two. So next slide, please. Okay, I found this on the Mystery, another Apologies, my phone thinks it's talk I'm talking to it. Um, <clears throat> so this city staff has been coordinating with uh, Boulder County Collaborative and has secured um, approximately $13.8 million to date um, through the HUD uh, Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, which is uh, the majority of funding for these channel improvements and railroad bridge replacement. Um, about 12.6 million of that 13.8 is funding the project. The additional funding that remains will help, um, is eligible for utility relocations and some property acquisition upstream at Boston Avenue. So next slide, please. Um, continuing to move upstream is uh, the Isaac Walton phase one reach. 
Again, a very constrained uh, section of the channel. Um, as the cross section shows, uh, this reach will continue the modular block retaining walls um, within this area. And <clears throat> one of the reasons we're doing that is to um, keep the improvements within, within the city owned property and, and limit the impact to the commercial and industrial properties on the North Bank and the St. Brain Mobile Home Park on the South Bank. We went through a lot of design iterations to um, really try to not have to relocate any mobile homes or, or any businesses through this reach. Um, that project is complete with final design and we anticipate going out to bid and starting construction late this year. And uh, the funding piece for that is the, the remainder of that FEMA PAP funding and, and local dollars. Next slide, please. Uh, continuing upstream is the Isaac Walton phase two reach. Again, that's the section of the creek that uh, city has been coordinating with the Army Corps of Engineers through their section 205 program. Um, we've been working with the Army Corps since 2016 on a feasibility study uh, to get to the point that we can um, call this the preferred alternative for the, for the improvements that we're gonna work on with the Army Corps. Um, in fact, that feasibility study is, is being routed within the Army Corps for their division commander's signature right now. As the cross section shows, this is a section where um, <clears throat> we move out of the, of the walls and back into a tiered uh, cross section for the channel with slope grading and um, a levee adjacent to the Isaac Walton Pond. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an exhibit that again kind of shows those uh, improvements. Again, it includes the replacement of the Boston Avenue Bridge, which is shown sort of in the yellow rectangle. Um, the, the, the hatching areas show the channel improvements, and then that beige area would be the levee that's uh, between the pond and the channel, which cuts off those Isaac Walton split flows. Um, to, to picture the levee, really just picture the berm that existed before the flood, but constructed in a um, in a more specified way and more resilient way so that it can be classified as a levy. Um, but it's, it's, it doesn't intend to be a structure that's elevated 15 feet in the air above existing grade and surrounding area. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So to expand a little bit on um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 205 program, again, it's, it, it has a $15 million project limit. Typically that uh, is 65% uh, federal funding through the Army Corps with 35% minimum local match. The city's local funding match is um, made up of, of a cash contribution of a minimum of 5% of the total project cost. Uh, the Army Corps gives credit for any land owned or land acquired needed within the project footprint. And then they give credit for any work in kind, which in this case, the city is using the Boston Avenue bridge replacement. Um, <clears throat> as Dale mentioned before at the introduction, uh, we staff has been negotiating and coordinating with the Army Corps to draft up a public partnership agreement. Um, we plan to bring that in front of council at the August 11th regular session for consideration. Uh, the public partnership agreement or PPA includes final design and construction of the Isaac Walton Reach 2 improvements. Um, one thing about the Army Corps that's unique in comparison to some of our previous funding partners is that the Army Corps will actually manage uh, final design. And they will also manage bidding and construction of the improvements, and in this case, the channel improvements. The city would maintain uh, design and construction of our match, the Boston Avenue Bridge replacement. Um, and then at the end of the day, once all the work is complete, the city would own and maintain uh, that infrastructure. Um, currently, uh, that you'll, what you'll see in your council packet for the August 11th in the PPA is that the current cost estimate for the project is about $14.7 million. And the Army Corps match is about 51% or $7.5 million. And the city's match <clears throat> is about 49%, largely made up of, um, again, our, our work in kind with the Boston Avenue bridge replacement. Um, so uh, as Dell said at the end of this presentation, we can certainly talk more about that um, if needed. One of the things I wanna highlight is that in the 2021 CIP budget, uh, which will be presented to council later this year, uh, that budget includes funding for construction of the Boston Avenue Bridge replacement, which is under the transportation TRP 118. 
So um, approval of that, of that TRP 118 project provides the city's required match or part of the city's required match for our local funding. Um, and then finally, we would initiate one more letter of map revision after this project's complete. So next slide. Again, this slide illustrates the benefits of, of the stream improvements once they're complete up to South Sunset Street. The areas in blue, again, represent the 100-year floodplain. And similar to the previous slide, the uh, areas in the black crosshatch show um, those properties that would be removed from the 100-year floodplain. And so you can really start to see um, the benefits of all the work currently completed and that's planned up the South Sunset, which would remove approximately that hatched area is about 266 acres and several hundred commercial buildings and, and residential homes. Um, <clears throat> so next slide, please. So mentioned before, upstream of, of South Sunset Street, we refer to as City Reach 3, which again extends from Sunset up to Airport Road. This reach is currently unfunded. Uh, we have completed, again, a master plan and some conceptual level design for this reach. Uh, staff would expect to phase the final design uh, with <clears throat> and construction within that reach based on available funding, similar to how work was completed downstream. Uh, this slide illustrates the Hover Road reach from Sunset to uh, Hover Road, including a, a box culvert. This is the preferred alternative that we've presented and discussed with council in the past. It's, we refer to it sometimes as the split flow alternative. So it's a split flow uh, channel through the fairgrounds pond, capturing water that's already come out of the bank west of Hover Road, bringing that, uh, those flood flows back into the main stem of the creek. <clears throat> um, this project is estimated to be about $20 million. And the benefits of the project, um, so in this slide, the blue and the pink together represent the 100-year floodplain um, again, north of the creek, that floodplain was mitigate, would be mitigated with the core project, but on the south bank of the creek and east of Hover Road, all that area in peak, pink is uh, floodplain and, and property that would be removed uh, if this project on the Hover Road reach can be completed. So that's a significant portion of the developed uh, section of the city of Longmont that can be removed from the St. Brain Creek floodplain with this project. Um, <clears throat> So currently staff is preparing a uh, FEMA pre-disaster mitigation or PDM grant application for funding this Hover Road reach. Um, the FEMA PDM program is, is a 75% federal share and a 25% local match. So that would be roughly $15 million um, if we can get fully funded through the grant, $15 million in federal funding and $5 million required for a local match. Um, <clears throat> should we be awarded the grant funding, we would need to consider alternatives for our local funding match. Um, some options that could be available are leveraging other capital improvement projects, such as TRP 117, which is currently unfunded, but is the Hover Road Bridge over St. Brain Creek improvements, or potentially, um, you know, a future storm drainage bond or rate increases within that uh, program. So. Staff, um, as, we, as we move further along in, in that grant application process, we certainly plan to provide a future update to council regarding that uh, grant application and local funding alternatives. And then finally, um, work upstream of Hover Road to uh, Airport Road is about $40 million more of improvements. And, and again, those are currently unfunded. So next slide, please. And that does conclude the update for the Resilient St. Brain project. And uh, thank you for your time and attention this evening. And we're happy to, to take any questions that you might have. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Uh, <clears throat> Josh, thank you so much. I am, um, I'm in awe and I, uh, I'm, um, in envy, what an incredible engineering project this is. It's so varied and so extensive. And uh, I think you guys have done an amazingly thoughtful and uh, hard work on this project for everybody involved from city manager, um, public, all the public works and 
Um, and I know some of this lo looks kind of bleak right now, but uh, as somebody who gardens and has been doing that for a number of years, it's going to look really good in a few years. It's just, uh, it takes time. Plants take time. Um, so I was going to say, how are we going to get that money? What are we going to do? We have to do something. We have to write to, you know, but you guys have already thought about some of those things. Any amount of anything that this council can do to uh, say write letters to ask for federal help, we'll certainly do, I think. And um, uh, federal help, state help, county help, Dr. Cog help, um, anything we will be happy to, uh, I think all of us will be happy to sign our name to a letter asking for help. <laughs> Thanks again. You're welcome, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank All you. right. Hey, Mayor. What's yep. what's sur what's surreal around about this presentation and seeing it is a the great work they've done. What people don't realize is when they were building the railroad bridge, they actually had to keep the railroad operating while they were building the bridge. So when you get into the details on this, uh, phenomenal work, Nick, Josh, Dale, the entire group. What's interesting is this was our first federally federal disaster in 2013. The surreal part is we're still in it and working on projects and closing out when we have another one that we're dealing with. And that was just to sort of remind uh, you all in the community. It's, um, it was one of those moments where you just went, wow, we've got two. But it, it really is a testament to the phenomenal work that they do. And uh, if you ever want to go out, let us know and we'll, we'll walk you through that area. It's, it, it's good to get the the first-hand tour from Josh and Nick because they really work you through all the details. Thank you. All right, anything, oh, Councilor Peck. Josh, can I, uh, or can we have a copy of that video? It's great. Uh, absolutely. Great, thanks. Sure. All right, anything else? All right, Josh, good job. We really appreciate it. Um, having had a front row seat to the floods of 2013, um, uh, it's amazing how much progress we've made. Dale, uh, thanks to you and your staff for, for everything you've done. I, 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 we, we would be a much different city if we didn't have your dedication, passion, love, and experience, and knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. I just felt so, fortunate tonight that I... Uh, didn't have to talk after watching that video. It, uh, well, I, I think I, I would have been a little, little choked up, so. I was gonna be positive, but we're all grateful we didn't hear from you either, but you still did a good job. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and move on to when to get firming project allotment contract review, please. And um, so uh, again, while they're loading the, the slideshow for this one, um, City Council, tonight is your study session. Um, and it's to, um, for staff to bring to you um, the, uh, the Windy Gap Firming Project. Um, I, I think the really good news that we have tonight is that uh, we believe um, staff together with the Water Board have really arrived at what we believe to be um, not only a doable a level of participation in the project, but most importantly, one that will uh, meet the long-term needs of this community uh, through the build-out of the, of the Envision Longmont uh, planning area, uh, and, and importantly as well, uh, to position Longmont and to, to continue to position Longmont to um, be able to meet all the unknowns coming to us with climate change and, and other challenges that we know our community is going to face. And so, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy tonight to, to bring this to you. And uh, similar to the Army Corps project, uh, we will also be bringing to you, um, likely in September, the um, uh, allotment contracts for the Windy Gap project. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ken Hewson and, and Becky Doyle to uh, give you a, a presentation on the project, uh, both in a status update as well as to uh, discuss the issues of participation level and, and, and those items. So go ahead, Ken. Thank you, Dale. And uh, 
Council, uh, Mayor and Council, um, Ken Houston, Water Resources Manager with Public Works Natural Resources Department. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Um, could we have the next slide? Tonight, we'd like to give you a summary of the Windy Gap firming project, uh, the history and status of it, uh, review the allotment contract and escrow agreements. <clears throat> That's two agreements that we'll be bringing back in September for council's action. We wanted to be able to give you a preview of it and get any input you might have on those um, two agreements. And then finally, um, we'll ask at the end, ask us council to give direct staff regarding the final participation level for the Windy Gap uh, firming project. Uh, next slide, please. The, I'd like to first briefly, especially for the public, to let them understand uh, Longmont's uh, raw water source. Um, there's really two raw water sources Longmont uses for its water. The first is the native basin water, which is the St. Vrain Creek. Um, this map shows the area um, west of Longmont up to the Continental Divide. Um, Primarily the North St. Rain, but also South St. Rain water um, is what we utilize. It's about two thirds of our water supply. And then about one third of our water supply is from the West Slope. Um, two sources, the Windy Gap uh, project and the Colorado Big Thompson project. Both of those projects um, are stored in Lake Granby, which is on the left side of the map there. And it then um, is pumped through um, Shadow Mountain Grand Lake flows through the Alva B. Adams Tunnel into um, uh, eventually ending up in Carter Lake for delivery to Longmont. Um, next slide, please. Um, wanted to give you a little bit of project history on the on both the Windy Gap parent project, the diversion project, and also the history of the Windy Gap firming project. On the parent project, the actual diversion out of the uh, Colorado River, um, in 1967, Longmont's Mayor Ralph Price, on behalf of uh, six Front Range cities, filed for that water right. Um, it took about uh, 20 years after that to actually get the project constructed and operational. It, it became operational in 1985, and it primarily utilizes the Colorado Big Thompson project to get the water here to the West Slope. As part of that original project, um, it was always contemplated that a storage reservoir would need to be built Early on, in the, or early on in the parent project, uh, filing was made for what was called um, the Jasper Reservoir on the West Slope. And um, in 1999, uh, as, the, as the parent project was, um, payments were being made and, and the project was uh, completely operational, um, the second phase of the project or the storage component was being investigated. It started in 1999 um, and one of the first steps you have to do is uh, work through the federal permitting processes. And the very first step is to uh, do uh, an alternatives analysis of, of the different um, alternatives to um, what then was contemplated the Jasper project. Um, Chimney Hollow Reservoir, which is where we are today, was one of those of over 200 reservoir sites that were looked at. Um, and studied extensively. As part of that process, it became quickly obvious that um, really um, having the project, uh, the storage project on the east slope was very beneficial. I think the flood of 2013 taught us that um, the more resilient, the, the closer your supply can be to, to your facilities, um, the better off you are. Um, both, both some, some environmental concerns with the reservoir site on the west side, as well as the fact that having that storage on the east slope was much better, um, led us to the um, Chimney Hollow site as the preferred site. At that point, um, started legal and permitting um, for that site. Um, we also uh, started the, 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 for the legal permitting, there were numerous, numerous um, project uh, legal permits that were required. Uh, we had to get a 1041 permit from Grand County, um, a 401 water quality through the state, a 404 permit, fill and dredge permit from the Corps, as well as the overall project permit from the U United States Bureau of Reclamation, which is the owner and operator of the Colorado Big Thompson project. 
that's really the permit that um, uh, allows the project to move forward. Um, and that permit, um, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation is the lead federal agency for permitting for this project. Um, there were two legal actions that are necessary to bring this project forward. Um, the first one is um, filing in the state water court uh, to make sure that all of the permitting, all of the activity we're doing as well as the, the storage vessel and how we intend to use it uh, is legal as well as one of the mitigation projects uh, this project is doing is the construction of a connectivity channel around the Windy Gap Reservoir on the west slope where we divert the water to provide connectivity from above to below that reservoir. Um, that needed a, a, a state uh, decree as well. Um, I'm pleased to report today that um, the uh, that case has made its way through water court. The referee signed the final decree uh, in early July. There was a 21 day uh, protest period as in all water rights cases. That 21 day per, uh, protest period has expired and there were no protests filed. So the last action for that um, case is to have the uh, uh, judge in, in Water Division 5 to sign that. Um, we're expecting that at any time. But that, that pretty much um, the most significant item we had was getting that state water court. There was also was a federal case, um, a challenge to the uh, issuance of both the 404 permit, uh, primarily the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation permit for the project. Um, that was filed in 2017. Uh, the final um, arguments and uh, action on that case occurred in July of 2019. So we're just a little over a year from uh, the final arguments in that case. We're waiting any day. Uh, we hope sooner than later, but it, it, it could, we don't know exactly when uh, the federal court will give us a ruling on that. Uh, we really need to get that case settled before we can actually start the uh, project. Um, the design is 100% complete and a contractor has been selected. That's Bernard Construction. They're out of Montana and they do done major, major dam and reservoir construction all over um, the U.S. and the world. Um, they're actually on site. Um, they're doing a little bit of grubbing. Mostly what they're doing is um, getting their projects, submittals uh, through and uh, design of the coffer dam and things like that so that when the federal case is done, we're actually able to start moving quite quickly on that. And then finally, uh, on the environmental aspects, um, again, as we mentioned, all the permits are, are done, um, including um, the, the mitigation uh, of the any impacts of the project fully 100% mitigated and a number of enhancement projects which will actually make um, the project a, a net positive environmental uh, impact. And on the next slide, please. This is, um, next slide is a, a rendering of what the reservoir will look like when it's completed. On the left side, you can see Carter Lake. I think most people are familiar with Carter Lake. Um, there's a uh, chimney hollows on the middle of the picture there, um, the shinier reservoir. <laughs> That's what the reservoir will look like when it's constructed. Uh, look, it'll really be almost a twin of Carter Lake. Um, and all the property was acquired a number of years ago. So we're, we're ready to move forward on that. One of the aspects that, that I think is great beyond the water supply, if you look just to the right side of the Chimney Hollow Reservoir, you see the mountainside there with um, the, the greener area. That's Blue Mountain. It's um, It was purchased by Larimer County as part of the purchase of all the property out there. There's about 3,000 acres, an area similar in size to Button Rock Preserve that um, when this reservoir is constructed, it, the entire area will be open for public uh, recreation and use, which will really help, um, I believe it will be an asset to our community having that great of a, a facility that close to it. 
Um, next slide, please. We'd like to go through real quickly then on the allotment contract and, and the escrow agreements and um, just a, a real quick explanation of an allotment contract. Um, it's it, the, uh, an allotment contract essentially gives us an allotment in the, in the reservoir itself. Um, it's an undivided interest. We'll have, um, currently we're subscribed to 8,000 acre feet. Whatever we finally subscribe to, that's um, what we'll uh, receive an allotment for. That's why it's called an allotment contract. It's similar, if you can think of it as like a, a share in a company, you don't own any specific part of it, but you own an undivided interest. Um, that's that's the important aspect of the allotment contract. Um, there are eight really key parts of the allotment contract that you have before you turn out. Just real quickly go through those, kind of explain them. Um, the first the first section is just um, definitions. The second section um, is allotting the su subscribed capacity in the reservoir. In, in our case, either what, what we choose tonight will be that allotted capacity. Um, the third section describes the construction of the project and how the project will be completed. Um, that really carries you through construction and won't be applicable after the construction. The fourth section outlines operation of the project after the completion. There are numerous, numerous agreements and, and permits and um, input to this reservoir and how it will operate. It can't all be covered in the allotment contract. The allotment contract really for operations sets that up and there will be a separate um, operational criteria that will be developed over time after, after that happens. Um, the fifth part of it is the term of the contract. Um, it's a perpetual contract as long as we uh, you know, meet our um, payment obligations. Um, how you might transfer an allotment in the future after construction, any default provisions, um, not only if Longmont were to default, but more importantly, if somebody else in the project would default, uh, which protects Longmont, and, again, and any amendment processes for the uh, allotment contract. The sec sixth section is just describes the funding and how it'll process. Um, and then finally, important to Longmont, the seventh section is provisions for cash allottees. Longmont will be a cash allottee. Um, there are people who bring cash and there will be people who will participate in pooled financing. Longmont um, will be a cash allottee. So the uh, seventh section really applies to Longmont. Finally, the eighth, eighth section, which won't apply to Longmont, uh, is pooled financing um, allottees. And then finally, it also attached is a sample escrow agreement. Um, it simply will be putting a lot of money, um, moving a lot of money up to the Windy Gap Firming Project Enterprise for, um, then they will hold that money during the construction process. So that just gives us um, some legal um, protection on how, how, how that money is allocated, how that money is uh, invested in and how it's it's done. Um, and then next slide, please. Finally, we wanted to talk a little bit about, and most importantly, focus in on the financial considerations for this project. Um, we are currently subscribed in the project at 8,000 acre feet. Um, that was a previous city council direction. Um, we've been in there for about three or four years now at that level. The total cost um, for that is about $60 million, just a little bit less at 8,000 acre feet. We're also looking closely at 7,500 acre feet as our participation and that that will cost us around 56 million um, for that funding level. Um, the funding sources for this project, there's really four um, internal funding sources and then a fifth, which is um, you, you may remember in 2017, the citizens approved a bond for $36.3 million, uh, which we will use that, uh, we will sell those bonds and use that funding for the majority of this project. Then finally, four internal funds that will be used are the Water Construction Fund. That is revenue generated um, from the sales of water taps um, at new development. The Water Operating Fund, which is our rate revenue, um, there also uh, is money in a raw water storage fund, which we've kept since uh, we had high mountain dams up in Rocky Mountain National Park, where we sold the dam and the, and the easement back to the park. And we have about a half a million dollars of that money left, which we'll put into this project. 
And finally, um, cash in lieu of water rights. Um, we have about six and a half million dollars um, in the bank right now and anticipate a little bit more uh, as development occurs in the next year or so. So all of that funding will be used um, for this. Um, we've really looked at um, the participation level based upon our future water supply needs and our financial considerations. And at this point, um, next slide, please. At this point, we've we've looked at that with um, both with Water Board and and I do have a recommendation. Kind of the, the areas we're looking at right now is the 8,000 acre feet that we're currently at. Um, the, the minimum future water supply we really need for um, the eventual um, planning horizon for the city is 6,300 acre feet. Um, we looked at both of those areas. We also looked at, um, tried to balance both the, the level of the water um, that we get as in our financial considerations. And currently we believe we can fit the project in at 7,500 acre feet without um, unduly impacting uh, some of our uh, asset management. We have a number of existing assets in our system that are requiring um, rehabilitation. Uh, and so at 7,500 acre feet, we're able to balance keeping our system running as well as um, being able to fund it. And finally, there are many other considerations that could be looked at. Um, they're really undetermined. Future water conservation might bring it down a little bit. Um, more, more impactful climate uh, impacts could bring it up. So those are all really undetermined and really at this point, we're not able to, to give you a really good recommendation from those. So as such, um, staff went to Water Board, recommended 7,500 acre feet as, to help with our financial considerations. Water Board reviewed that and um, agreed with that and, and unanimously recommend uh, City Council to uh, participate at the uh, 7,500 acre foot level. So next slide, please. At this point, that kind of concludes my uh, presentation on, on the history and the summary. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. We also have um, our legal counsel on tonight in case you have any specific legal questions about the allotment uh, contract. Um, we have uh, Jeff Drager, a representative from Northern Water, who could answer. He's the project manager for this project, could answer, help answer questions. So we'd be happy to answer any questions or um, take input, um, primarily with respect to the uh, financial uh, the participation level. After we get that input, we will um, take that back to Northern. We'll come up with a final allotment contract and that final allotment contract will go to Water Board in their August meeting and City Council in hopefully September. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I have a question about the pooled funding uh, option that it's been understood from the beginning Longmont would not participate in. Um, can you explain why that decision was from the beginning that Longmont would not would would go the funding on its own and not participate in the pooled funding? Uh, yes, Mayor Councilmember Martin, uh, be happy to. The pooled financing um, is, is a great tool. In fact, we used that in the original uh, Windy Gap parent project um, funding. And unfortunately, one of the aspects of pooled financing is that to be able to help sell the bonds in a pooled financing scheme, the investors are gonna wanna see what's called um, a step up provision. In essence, if any one of the one or more of the participants in a pooled financing were to not make their payments, the other participants would step up and make the payments for them. Um, they would they would get their allotment con capacity if they did that, but they would still be on the hook. Uh, uniquely to Longmont, um, that basically counts against our bonding capacity. And so if that were to happen, um, we would have to count that against our bonding capacity, which would limit 
the amount of bonding we would be able to take out, which we would then not have enough bonding capacity to move forward with the project. So it became almost um, impossible for us to participate in the pooled financing. And uh, what is unique about the Longmont City Charter that makes it count on uh, against our bonding capacity? Uh, I'll, I'll let D. Weiser answer that if he if he doesn't mind, <laughs> or or Becky. Or Becky. Uh, Mayor and Council, I'm happy to answer that. I'm Becky Doyle, Assistant Director of Business Services in Public Works and Natural Resources. Uh, the Longmont Charter has a requirement that we. Uh, go to the voters for all issuance of debt. Uh, enterprises under Tabor do not, uh, in D, D, I see D's in here now, so he can jump in where I'm wrong, but um, Tabor enterprises generally do not have that requirement, so that's something that's unique to Longmont, um, and, and we would need to get voter approval to increase our, our bond authority to cover that um, step-up provision if we wanted to participate in the pooled finance. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? No, Becky's spot on. It's just the charter requirement for an election and it would be a challenge for us to figure out how big an election to have if you have to step up for others. I, th I think the other good news for Longmont is our um, bonding uh, um, rate is also very competitive with um, other entities. And I'm, uh, I know uh, Jim Golden and Dee and folks and Jim Benair have done an excellent job over the years of, of keeping Longmont in a very competitive position such that we get very favorable bond rates when we go to the market as well as a city. I get Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Ken and, and or Dale, um, the, the, the $36 million uh, authorized by the voters through the sale of bonds, what percentage of the total cost of this project was that originally intended to cover? I'm actually going to let Becky answer that, but I'm, I'll, I'll try the answer, uh, Councilmember Waters. I believe when we uh, went to the bond election, uh, the price per acre foot of the project was such that we believed that the 36 million would be sufficient for up to 10,000 acre feet of participation in the project. And as you know, uh, we, we had some fairly significant increases in, in the project uh, costs uh, over the last uh, year or so. Um, and, and that's what has now arrived us back to um, uh, the point where, we're, where we are today. I, I think the key difference going forward from now though is that we have uh, the contract in place and we also have some very healthy contingencies. And so um, I don't believe we're in the same position as we were uh, when we went for that bond election. So, so one related question, and I, and I don't wanna go back and debate the whole set of issues around 6,000 to 8,000 to 10,000. But Dale, your, uh, your original presentation to the council, the estimate I see tonight, it was 6,300. As I recall, at the time you made that presentation was 6,000. And then, you know, the council at that time went to 10, the subsequent council went to eight. Um, is there anything in your calculus, apparently, you now are estimating that the the, the requirement would be 63 versus 6,000. Uh, if we were just coming at this uh, to get to the, at least to the minimum we would need. Um, so what would be the, if you, if you scale it back to 6,300, what would that cost be? You, I, I assume you've done that. That has to be. Uh, we have, I'll let Becky answer that question. But before um, Becky goes through that, one thing, um, one thing I will also say is that um, and actually, Councilman Waters, uh, you made this point very clear, I believe, about a year ago. And, and I do remember it. Um, we need to be very careful uh, to participate at a level that we can afford. And one that does not put uh, the balance of the utility in jeopardy. And one that does not further increase the rates on our customers. And so 
we certainly agree with that. That is uh, part of what we were looking at. And that is part of the um, calculus, if you will, um, that went into the decision-making process to arrive at the 7,500 acre foot level. Uh, you know, the last thing I wanted to do, similar to you, was to have another debate about participation level in the project. Um, the difference now though, is that um, you, uh, the water board is unanimous in, in the staff recommendation of, of lowering our participation level down to 7,500. Again, so as to not jeopardize the balance of the capital needs within the overall utility uh, in line with that line of thinking, um, build what you can afford and for gosh sakes, um, hope that that is enough to meet your needs. And in this case, it's both. It's what we can afford. We believe it will meet our needs. We believe we will have a little bit of cushion, but Becky, you can also respond on what the 6,300 acre foot cost would be. So Mayor and Council Member Waters, the uh, cost for 6,300 acre foot at the current, current per acre foot cost is approximately $47 million. So 55 million at 8,000, 51 million at 7,500, 40, you say 40, 48 million, 47 million at 6,300. Yeah. All right. Um, and Dale, just for the, just, just to clear my head, there's nothing in, in your, your estimates. Um, what I heard you say is the 63, the 7,500 is, um, uh, exceeds the minimum requirement with some cushion, I think was what I heard you say. All right. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that the water board and the staff now are offering the same recommendation, which was not the case before. And I, I think that's a good thing. I appreciate the fact that you've come to, they've come together with the staff on that recommendation. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Council Member Martin. Yeah, just, just to get all of the parameters on the table, um, because I was at the water board meeting where they um, made this decision and, and I kind of reluctantly concur with it. Um, although uh, at the tutelage of the water board for the past two and a half years, I've kind of liked the idea of having water access, as, assets in reserve, um, which wasn't high on my priorities list originally when I came into office, but um, uh, speaking of cushions, um, what is the assumption on the amount of water conservation or the rate of water conservation that is done by the water users of the city um, in that build out requirements estimate? I mean, is that um, assuming the current level of usage? Is that a, a, a assuming a rate of conservation and decline in water usage or, you know, where does that estimate, where does that projection fit? Uh, Mayor and Council Member Martin, the current projections uh, anticipate 10% uh, water conservation savings at time of build out. That's both savings of where we are with our water now, as well as future water use, you know, new growth will consume uh, ten percent less water. Um, it, it anticipates that, yes. Mm -hmm. And there's there's been a historic preference uh, precedent for that in the sense that we've been achieving that for a while. Absolutely, mm -hmm. the, the city has been certainly on that uh, that track, and um, um, and 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 I believe it will continue because I believe. Um, Certainly, we're all coming to a, a clear understanding that we're living in the arid West. And then on top of that, that we have climate change coming at us. And I think every responsible um, member of the community is looking at that and uh, trying to figure out how to reduce their water use where they can. And, and we want to be part of that. We want um, to be actively working with uh, customers to reduce their water demand where we can. Thank you. All right, Council Member Beck. Um, 
Can we make motions now? I think we can. So I move that we direct staff to accept the water board's recommendation of uh, a 7,500 acre feet participation level. Second. All right, that's going to be going down from 8,000, correct? Correct. All right, I don't see anybody else. I'm gonna be voting against it only because I uh, sit in on a lot of these uh, meetings with PRPA. It was on the, it was on the uh, any, anyway, I'm done. We're not, we're not gonna debate it. I just think that uh, water's the currency of the future. And I think we can, if we can control it, we can protect it. But anyway, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed say nay, nay. All right, uh, the motion passes six to one with Mayor Bagley dissenting. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley and council. And as Kid mentioned, uh, we're gonna keep uh, pushing this uh, uh, project forward. And uh, with any luck, we will we'll have an allotment contract in front of you as, as potentially as early as September. Thank you again for your time and uh, your support. All right, great. Let's go ahead. And do you guys mind if we take a five minute break? It's been two and a half hours and maybe our backs and our bladders would appreciate a little bit of a break. So, all right, back in five guys.
ahead and get on to discussion discussing the options regarding sleeper vehicles parked on public property. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bagley and, and council members. I will be leading us through a um, presentation uh, that was put together by our SWAPS team, Safe and Welcoming Places team. Uh, in that team tonight, presenting, representing that team tonight is myself, Adiberto Mendoza, uh, Project Coordinator for Community Services, Jeff Satter, Deputy Public Chief, uh, Safety Chief, Nathan Sch Schultz uh, from Code Enforcement, Tim Hull, uh, Assistant City Attorney. We've also invited um, Joseph Zanovich from Hope uh, for Longmont to provide any answers to any questions around um, safe lots as well. And of course, Karen Roney, Community Services Director. Don, if you wouldn't mind um, starting the PowerPoint, please. So my goal tonight is just to go through this uh, as quickly as we possibly can so we can ensure enough time for conversation and discussion with uh, council members. Uh, so Don, you go to the next slide. So the SWAPS team is uh, really a, a, a cross-divisional, cross-department team that is looking at how we ensure safety and make sure that our public places are welcoming. This is just a list of the, of the members on that team. Uh, next slide. You know, as mentioned in the council communication, we've seen a uh, continued growth of RVs on, and campers on public streets. Uh, Nathan put together this information around what code has been seeing as far as RV abandonment cases. And he, you can compare 2019 to 2020, January through June. Next slide. And these are also cases that public safety has received uh, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, they're very similar. You can see there's some peaks and there is some uh, valleys in the amount, but they continue to see uh, cases coming in. Um, and the, there was a drop off in, in the winter as far as, far as cases received, and, uh, but there's increase over the summer as well. Next slide. Now this is some data that came from our uh, Safe Lot Task Force, our data team, when we instituted the, um, the survey one, two, three data that I showed to you in February. Um, we did this, we were planning to do this through the end of March, but due to COVID, we did it through mid-March, but you can see the numbers. We had 42 RVs operating and a, um, a little over, 10 or 12 uh, that were not operating. We see some of the numbers and you see also uh, a GIS map of where those uh, contacts were. Next slide. And then here are some examples that were provided by public safety and code enforcement of just some of the issues that we've experienced. Um, you can keep going, Don. So here's some more examples of trash and inoperable RVs that are uh, in our, in our, somewhere in our open spaces, parking lots. Um, next slide. And of course, some of the issues of leaking fluids into the city storm drains um, that is, that happen where the, they're parked. Next slide. Some more examples of that. Next slide. And then just uh, some more examples of trash being um, left or that piles up next to them and, and blocks sidewalks. Next slide. And here's an example of, uh, again, more trash, but example of, of creating a makeshift living room on the city street. And finally, here's an example of a little more dangerous situation. As you can see, there are propane tanks in this um, RV, um, which of course, can cause um, hazardous conditions. So those are just some examples that you can go to the next slide. Um, here's some of the costs. Uh, these are not, I not told them, but just wanted to share. So the RV cleaning cost, this is not the towing from the street or storage, it's just what it costs um, to clean out some RVs. You can see in 2019, uh, we spent 17,000 in just cleaning costs and so far in 2020, we're already at 19,000. Um, and then you can see on the next side, 
a, a little more of a, of a table of what an average total cost per RV is around 3,305. Um, 18 RVs were towed between March and December 2019, and, and 17 have been towed between January and June of 2020. So those costs tend to accumulate. Um, and I know that they've talked that um, we have allocated some more funding to disposal as well. Uh, Jeff can, can talk to that later. Uh, next slide. And currently we still have uh, six that need to be cleaned at, that is at the storage lot and eight remaining in storage which were towed between April 2017 and October 2018, and four more that, that still need to be towed to, to salvage. So next slide. So, uh, you know, there are some options for parking an RV uh, in Longmont and then some further from Longmont. This is the country wood in an RV park that's on 1550 Main Street. This is, this is their website and it shows you kind of what its amenities are but also it's cost and, and that's something to, to, to point out that these, these are cost prohibitive depending on the size of the RV. Um, you can see there are some of the, some of the rates, both weekly and monthly. Uh, next slide. And then the next closest one that um, we've, we could find was Johnson's Corner. Um, and here's, it, it is less expensive um, they do have some other restrictions on how old the RV could, it needs to be. Um, I think our team could answer some questions around that. Uh, but just wanted to give, an ex give some op examples of options that, that uh, folks who are living in RVs can, can um, could find as far as park, more permanent parking. Next slide. And so this is what we're, we're, we're rec what the swaps team is recommending uh, staff um, or staff is asking council for direction around the recommendations uh, to eliminate the allowance uh, to move sleeper vehicles parked on public street every 48 hours uh, and relocate to different areas defined in the current ordinance. Instead, we swaps is recommended all sleeper vehicles be prohibited from parking on public property, including any portion of highway street alley or the or other right away with some exceptions. So for example, uh, active loading and unloading, um, as you can read there, which means a period of time in which a person or persons are physically engaged in actually in the labor of, un of or unloading from an apartment, et cetera. Um, and finally, to modify the current code section that allows individuals to apply for, permit, for a permit for time limited parking on public property. Um, so this is just, Part of the recommendations, we, we, depending on direction from council, we can bring more detailed um, recommendations back. Next slide. So one of the things that just the last thing I want to share is that we did, um, the SWAPS team who looked at this did look at other cities um, and we did talk to Lakewood. They recently passed um, in our, a stricter RV ordinance and you can read what they would what, what they what they said and basically it really um, helps with the enforcement and it helped you know clean up the streets in the city of Lakewood. So I think that's the last slide and um, love to open it up for discussions and questions. Like I said we have a, a, a team here that can answer questions for um, the council. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Alberto. Um, uh, you said that there were uh, 42 uh, operating functional RVs that were counted in uh, 2019. Is that correct? So, Councilman uh, uh, Mayor Bagley, Councilmember Martin, that that number came from the Survey One Two Three app that happened between January 27th and March 19th of this year. Ah, even better, thank you. Um, and uh, you showed some pictures of interiors of RVs that were pretty trashed and um, people uh, obviously occupied RVs that had a lot of stuff uh, on the sidewalk. Um, were, do you have any understanding of whether those photos were um, of, from occupied Operating RVs or from uh, or from occupied uh, non-operational RVs. 
So I will let Nathan or or, or Deputy Chief uh, Setter respond to that. Sure. Uh, go ahead, David. Yeah, so I'm Nathan Schultz with Longmont Code Enforcement. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I was the one who put together some of those photos. They were not all mine, but they did mostly come from our Code Enforcement Division. We don't necessarily keep track of junked by, by code, junked motor vehicles that are also um, associated with the transient population. But I can say that the majority of those, if not all of those photos that you saw were occupied RVs or RVs that as a result of this continuing uh, problem were left in city parks and were, um, and then did contain those hazardous materials like the propane tanks and car batteries. So that's, that's a pretty common scene among the ones that are occupied, um, definitely. Okay. Um, can I operating add Operating or non-operating or both? Most of them were operated. Uh, as an example, in 2019, we tagged 170, the police department did. Uh, uh, Nathan and his team also in code enforcement tagged a lot of RVs, but in uh, 2019, we tagged 170 RVs. Uh, one of them we tagged uh, 11 times as it moved around the city and they just they keep moving we go there we find them they tag them and they move them uh, and that that's a common theme with our current ordinance so many of them are operable you saw in one of those pictures it did not have an engine uh, that individual is well known in our community he buys an RV he removes the engine and then he pulls it around with a car uh, so as long as they're moving it that 600 feet uh, we don't get to tow it until they break down and then we tow them. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and under what circumstance does this is this does the city become responsible for cleaning out these vehicles? I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure you don't clean them out and then give them back to the person that was living in it. No, the procedure on slide. Uh, 13 kind of outlines the process, uh, but uh, whoever tows it, the police or code, uh, we tow it to a storage lot. At that point, over the next 30 to 45 days, uh, we have a person that works on getting title for that RV. At any point during that time, the owner of that RV can claim the RV. They just have to pay the impound fee but the first tow is $245. Uh, then we pay $15 a day for storage. Uh, once we have title, that 30 to 45 days, once we have title, we contract with a cleaning company. They come in and they remove all the black water tanks, the gray water tanks, cabinets, things like that, all the debris inside, all the hazardous materials, the needles. Um, uh, one RV was packed, it took two full dumpsters. Uh, once it's cleaned, uh, then it gets loaded on a, uh, a flatbed. Sometimes they can take up to two or three, depending on the size. Uh, we pay $275 an hour to transport it to Greeley, where it gets shredded. And we got to pay uh, to and from, that's why the costs uh, range from anywhere from $2,500 to $3,500 per RV. Uh, but the city is paying for for that because I'm aware of one RV that got claimed. Uh, for the most part, nobody has come to the police department and asked to claim their vehicle. Okay, so it has to be has to be clean in order to be destroyed. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the salvage yard won't take it with black water tanks. We have to drain the oil. I, I mean, there's all kinds, it's, it's an environmental health hazard. I mean, that's part of the problem. These things are full of human waste uh, in their black water tanks, um, the gray water tanks, not to mention the oil. So we got to get rid of all that stuff. And, and it's very expensive, unfortunately. I understand. Um, the, so the last question is that uh, both uh, uh, tonight we heard from um, two people uh, who were living in RVs um, that uh, thought that it was a decent, good way to live and they wanted to continue doing it. Um, 
Uh, and I've talked to some different ones in the past that we didn't hear from tonight, uh, who are also um, consider these RVs to be home. And um, so do we have, uh, uh, we don't have any photos of RVs that are occupied by those people, I guess, um, because I, you know, they will hear, if they share their story, they will say, I, you know, I have a job here, I have family here, um, I have two sons who live with me in the RV and um, one's going to school and one has a job. Um, so what about people who are, uh, have ties to Longmont and just want to live in an RV? Um, I, I, don't, I don't see those in the examples that have been presented tonight, but we've heard from them before. I'm sure uh, we have tagged those vehicles and asked them to move on. Um, and and it, it's a matter of time for some individuals as the RVs eventually break down and, and we, uh, we, we end up towing them. But uh, that, that's the unfortunate part of this is we, we have people that are not impacting neighborhoods, not impacting business areas, not trashing. Uh, our parks not trashing uh, the right of ways, uh, and they, they and you don't see them, and they're, they they move around town and they they mind their business and hopefully they're dumping their human waste. Uh, but with 170 of these vehicles uh, that we tagged and moved around last year, um, I'm sure some of those people may have got a tag and asked to move on. Uh, the problem is there's it's very difficult to come up with a way of allowing somebody to live uh, within an RV and, and then have someone else that's trashing a neighborhood and draining their septic and draining their fluid into the storm drains. Um, it's really hard to distinguish between the two. It's, it's kind of an all or none thing. And, and I'll, I'll throw out, uh, sewage uh, and you know we every community member in this this town ha has sewage to their house has a we have a city code about use of public sewers required it says the owner of any house building property used for human occupancy employment commercial enterprise recreation or other purpose situated within the service area um, is required to have public sanitary sewer as required at the owner's expense. And so we have individuals in this town parking that do not have, they're living in those, those locations without proper connections to sanitation, which is why these RV parks are, are costly because they have to put in those kind of services for their their guests or the people that are renting those services. And it's very expensive. I think uh, Joe could talk about this, but when they did their safe lot study, um, they were estimating it was gonna cost 149 to 280,000 just to kind of outfit a lot to accommodate the RV and the sanitation needs for these individuals. And, and every individual has a sanitation need every day. And without water, without electricity to run the pumps, uh, there's, there's other things that we find in these RVs that is just not sanitary. And, and you know, one of the reasons disease went away in our world is because of sanitation. Hey, Jeff, I want to kind of, I think, I think part of that, the answer to the question and what I've learned from this, and I think Ellie Berto and Joseph can talk about it, it's, the different dynamics. Um, so if you take a population and then the different components that you have and how many you know we can be successful with or are willing to go into coordinated entry and try to move into that housing world, I think that's part of the discussion too. Eliberto, Joseph, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, I have a couple clarifying questions for, I had, sorry, I came with a list. I was channeling Dr. Waters here. Um, uh, but uh, two clarifying questions. 
Uh, one is uh, of those 173, I think you said it was, that you tagged in a period. 170. Mm -hmm. 170. Um, were those unique vehicles or unique tagging instances? No, those are, uh, some of them were tagged multiple times. The, I, I kind of sorted through it. Uh, one of them was tagged 11 times. So I, I went through and counted and there was 60 plus unique vehicles. Um, and a lot of those were tagged multiple times over the year. And okay. there's a lot of unknowns in here that I did not count because they didn't have a tag listed. So there's, a, 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 on my list, we keep an Excel spreadsheet. And on my list, there's a lot without a uh, tag number. They're just listed as unknown. So licensed vehicles that have a tag, there's uh, 60 plus vehicles in that group. Okay, very good. And then the last question is, uh, of the two lots that you can pay to rent um, for long term, I'm assuming, uh, 1550 North Main, I guess, and, and one in Johnstown, um, and they're expensive, I understand that. Uh, what's their access to public transportation to where you can get to Longmont's transportation network, public transportation network? I'm not familiar with Johnstown, but it, it's by the Johnson's Corner. So I don't know if there's bus services out there, but uh, 1550 Main is right at, right near 17th and Main. There's a bus stop at 17th. I think there's a bus stop down at 15th also. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, I see the RV situation in three different tiers. There's uh, the unemployed non-residents uh, who, who just wanna use their RV to camp out and move it wherever they want without any kind of responsibility. And they don't really have ties to our community. But when I looked at the slides, the one that said, it looks like we are surrounded by cities that have strict RV regulations that they are uh, enforcing. So who doesn't have them? Longmont. So that is where they can come and not be what they would be considered be hassled at this point because our, our regulations are fairly lax. Um, then there are the ones that are employed who want to live in RVs, but they don't wanna pay rent, they don't wanna pay the utility bills, et cetera, that are associated with having a, a structure, a permanent structure. Um, and I don't think those people should be allowed to park on our streets either. I understand that RV lots are expensive, but when you look at that as compared to rent in an apartment or uh, paying a mortgage, that's pretty cheap. So um, I don't think that we should allow them to live on our streets, in our, uh, on our trailheads, in our parks, because it is convenient for them. It is not convenient for us, and I really don't want our police chasing RVs around the city all the time. So I think those are two different sets. Then there are the people who have to live in an RV, not because they want to, but because their living conditions have changed, either because uh, rent has gone up, they've been evicted, uh, they lost their job, so they lost their living places. Um, and I do want Joseph to address this. Uh, so those are three different, to me, those are three different categories of people as, as Harold has often uh, referred to peeling the onion. And um, the, the center core are the people who would like to be in a house, in an apartment, but for some reason can't afford it. Uh, and I would just like to, uh, uh, refer back to the, the gentleman on PITBH uh, who said that he was parked in front of a person's house who allowed him to park there, but he would like to be in a home. He just doesn't have any place to park his RV. So uh, I'm gonna make a motion here because I want to discuss this. And if we make a motion, then we can open up the discussion. Um, and uh, then I have to move to where I wrote it down. So I'm going to move that we direct staff 
to engage Boulder County Housing Authority, the Boulder City, the Boulder County Commissioners, uh, Joseph Zanovich with Safe Lots, and the Boulder County Homeless Community Task Force in a discussion to use the Boulder County land on Alaska Avenue as an RV safe lot because we need options for people and the people who want a home need a safe place to park. And um, so uh, do I have a second for that to open up the discussion? Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Peck and seconded by Councilmember Christensen. Do we have some discussion on this matter? Mayor Council Bradley, can we have uh, Joseph Zanovich address this and tell us about the safe lots for cars that he has and what he has implemented as far as regulations and how that would, um, what he is seeing in RV, uh, RV campers now and what has been happening in the last month? I guess the I guess the the question becomes I, I guess the I I personally don't have a, a problem with it I guess my question is Harold um, what is Joseph Zanovich's role tonight Does he have a presentation for us um, Obviously he's here He's been invited into the room um, So I guess my question is My understanding was we were waiting to hear back from Deputy Commander Satter and uh, Eliberto Mendoza about um, You know So we, we put talk Go ahead. We, we, we put together a group of which Joseph has been part of the conversations with us in terms of how we're looking at this broader situation. And I think part of, part of that is some of the information that was given to Eliberto and uh, what he said to me in, in the sense of, and, and Joseph, if I misspeak, tell me. But um, on the RV issue, I think as we look at coordinated entry and, and how we're working on all of that, um, what 80 is it fair to say 80 to 90 percent of the people is that an accurate number that I heard from Eliberto in terms of get, engaging in, in the RV community generally engaging in the coordinated entry process there's not a desire to do that which kind of gets to the different tiers that we're talking about and then there's 10 percent or 20 percent of, of, of the folks that then are more willing to do that and I think it's that kind of experience that gets into the conversation to understand the different layers of, of, of the challenge that we're facing as a community. And so I asked him to talk a little bit about that, have him here to answer that. All right. Question. All right. So if he's, the, the, the thing is, the only reason, I just wanted to make sure that he was invited. I mean, obviously he was invited. I just wanted to make sure that, yeah. that what, I just don't want to get in a habit of council members inviting people. And then no, I did. Here, talk. I did. That, then we're good. Joseph, why don't you go ahead and take no more than five minutes, if you could, and just share your thoughts. You have to unmute, Joseph. I can't. There you go. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> yes, I came to crush the party, everyone. Um, Council, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, we, in what Alberto has discussed, uh, raised a bunch of uh, issues that we currently see. Um, uh, Harold, you also uh, brought upon some issues that yes, we're seeing. So the safe lot, let me just very quickly give an update on that. The, that the safe lot program is, is full. We only have eight spots for that. Um, I could double the size of the lot immediately tonight. It'll be full and we'll still have a waiting list. Um, the demand continues to grow for those living in vehicles. Prior to COVID, I would absolutely agree. We had an 80, 20, I would even say maybe even a 75, uh, well, yeah, 85, 15. I mean, it was pretty high percentage. When we went on outreach, we consistently found folks that were hesitant to move into a permanent housing model. Within the last two weeks, I, I can definitely say that is starting to shift. Um, I am starting to see folks that have been evicted. Uh, I've literally within the last five days, um, two families, one adult, um, living in trailer and RVs that um, are in situations because of what we're what you know what we're all what we're all facing right now. Um, that is changing uh, drastically the perspective that I had um, prior to uh, April, really. Um, 
So there is a need to help those folks, um, especially that are in that position, because they didn't choose to live in, in those those RVs or those trailers. Um, we're, we're helping out um, one family right now to get out of that situation, um, trying to make an exception at our safe flight, even though we don't take RVs, they were in a situation where we felt we could help them. Um, you know, so I really wanna challenge the mode of thinking on this that pre-COVID, I would agree with most everything that was said. There is a there is a definite shift and I feel like it's only going to get worse with those that have the ability to live in a trailer if they have that as an asset, they're going to be. Um, and we're already seeing it. I mean, I, I have three examples um, within the last, within this, within this week. Um, with the safe lot model, uh, you know, we, we screen everybody. There are very strict codes of conduct. Uh, we've, kicked, we've kicked out five people within the first month and a half of this lot opening. We were very strict on safety, code of conduct. They follow the rules. Um, they're there because they want to get out of there and, and onto a better um, better stage of life. And that's that's so vital and important. I think that when we talk about those in RVs, the gentleman who, who spoke publicly, I mean, a safe lot program would help him specifically. And there are a number of those folks in the city. Um, obviously, the big contention is those that, you know, if we talk about housing first, this doesn't qualify in the federal uh, definition of what, uh, you know, housing is. But to many folks, this is what they can afford. This is all they, this is, this is as far as they can go uh, in, a, in a housing model. And to many, they've made this their own, they've invested in these RVs. Um, you know, and yes, code enforcement change, you know, chases them around. We all know them. We all know the ones that live in, live in those RVs. And for the most part, those aren't the issue, the ones that are causing issues. I, I, we are finding the ones that come from out of the area um, um, cause the majority of the issues. I mean, so if we're looking at, if we want to take care of our own, the ones that are paying taxes, the ones that are working here, um, you know, there could be a safe model for them, um, whether it be a cheap plot of land and maybe we get them vouchers to dump at the fairgrounds temporarily. Um, but I don't want to see us dump everyone out of here because we have we have residents here that uh, they're part of our community. Um, and I think that if there's a way to, to get them the help that they need, um, you know, we can effectively do that. Um, the Safe Lot model can work in that regard. Um, obviously there's a lot of logistics to RVs, which is why Hope hasn't been able to, to deal with that yet. But you know, I want us to be um, cognizant and aware of what's happening with, with evictions. We are gonna see more people on our streets because of, because of the trend. I think part of that, I think the opportunity that we also have now that we didn't have two months ago um, is our involvement in well, where we are with the housing authority and, and the work that we're doing with the housing authority right now in terms of um, and the work that we have to do in terms, let's just take housing choice vouchers and what we can do to bring real housing opportunities um, to, to individuals that that are willing to move into the coordinated entry program and, and move through the process. And, and that's something that we're talking about to go A, and this is a, a slightly different conversation, but connected to it. How do we maximize the use of our housing choice vouchers that we have um, and, and really work with people? Because we know that that's work that we have to do and we need to do it very quickly. Um, two, if we can maximize it, can we actually grow the amount of housing choice vouchers that we have? So there's an interesting opportunity now in the work that we're doing to, to really integrate what, what we have in the housing authority model into this, into this conversation. I think the challenge for us, and, and legal will have to speak to this, is, is you have this gamut and you have you know, the group that they, that are coming in from the outside. You have others that are just moving around and the neighbors are calling. And, and then you have a group that's wanting to improve themselves, or, you know, improve their condition and, and move into these programs. I don't know if you can unilaterally create a program that can make those exceptions because we have to treat everyone the same. And I think Inherently, I'm going to look at Karen and Eliberto. That's the challenge. Is that correct, Karen? Uh, 
I mean, yeah, turn on in community services. So, so yeah, I mean, we, what we really are trying to, um, what we're trying to, to look for is folks that Joseph is trying to help through the current program. It's my computer. <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, what we really are trying to, or hoping to do is to connect up with folks that are in a situation where they temporarily lost their housing or they're really looking for a, a stable place to, um, to reside. And that's really what we are trying to do in terms of up through coordinated entry. But I think what um, Carol talked about with our opportunities on my housing authority, also with the um, with the CARES Act funding that is coming down um, to really provide housing assistance. Um, so we have a lot of resources at our disposal now that we didn't have pre-COVID. And um, so I think our, our interest is how do we hook up with the individuals who are who are struggling, who, um, who have a need for this bridge housing, and work to get folks into um, you know housing. And those, but generally some of the challenges that we're having are with folks that are not, um, who aren't um, who really interested in, in assistance. And that's some of the, the challenges that we're, we're at council members also about. Um, but we do have more resources than we had two months ago to help people who are, um, who are really struggling, who temporarily who lost their housing are looking for an opportunity. Can't hear you at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I think what Karen was kind of, was also talking about is so when you look at COVID connections and you, and, and you see the, the resources that are coming into the county and some of these other areas, um, in terms of those folks that have gone through the eviction, pro which it's interesting that they went through an eviction process because I think that's still not moving through. Um, those aren't moving right now. So I'd be interested to understand that a little bit. So, 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 the, so the only evictions happening right now, uh, uh, Harold, are ones that are based on behavior. Right. My understanding. Um, so you, you can be evicted based on behavior. Uh, I don't think right now you can be evicted based on, 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 on lack of payment. That's my understanding. We, we can get we can get more. Yeah, that's my that. understanding, and the and the behavior has to be what I've what, the way I understand it fairly significant um, in terms of actually getting a court case and moving through. But we can we can verify that. But I think the change condition is there are more resources coming in through the assistance program at the county level, being CARES funding, CARES funding in terms of what we have to really try to house folks. And and I think for the first time. In our history, we have the ability of the housing choice vouchers to match with this to maximize the amount of money that we have so we can get people into housing. Councilor Peck. So I guess my uh, reason for bringing this up is that um, if we are in fact going to change this ordinance that absolutely nobody can park on our public streets in uh, campers, sleeper trailers, uh, whatever you want to call them, then how do we separate the ones who actually have children in school here who have a job here, but do not have a home? And that is for me, the whole point of a safe lot was so that we, we actually can give those people a temporary uh, place to park become part of the coordinated entry because it is housing first. They're not living in a tent. We're not going to be able to, we're not going to say we have no housing. You have to go back out on the street until it comes up. Um, and I am not talking about long-term at all. I am talking about when we get housing available. For me, it doesn't matter how many vouchers you have if you don't have a place to use them. Um, and I understand we use them with hotels, et cetera. But the other two tiers that I was talking about, the basically what I'm gonna call travelers who just move around and the people who want to stay in, uh, in their RVs 
but they are employed. They do go to work. They can find another place to park that in a lot that is, um, that is equipped to have RVs. And yes, it's expensive, but as I said, no more expensive than rent or mortgage. Um, so I guess the question for me is with this whole discussion, are we going to say that no RVs, no sleeper trailers, no vans where people sleep and live in them 24 seven are going to be allowed on our public streets? And if so, I feel very strongly that we need to separate those into residents who really want to improve their situation. Um, and hopefully we can move them in and out very fast, but we don't know. I, I just, before we have a tsunami of people who are without housing, let's be proactive and think about how we can face this before it happens to us and help the police out. So that is, uh, that's the whole point of my discussion. Uh, I'm gonna start calling people, but just my two cents are that I don't, I mean, I, I, I don't only, I not only think, I know that our public streets were not built for housing people. Um, they bring a whole host of, if people are living on our streets, even in vehicles, um, that brings a whole host of problems, sanitation, education, um, law enforcement. And uh, I think that's a separate issue than the safe lots. But um, I believe there's a motion on the table currently that we're gonna need to vote on. So um, after that motion, I plan, if no one else does, I'll make a motion that we instruct staff to go ahead and prepare an ordinance saying that as the, the same ordinance that they, they along the lines that they presented in tonight's presentation that um, we do not allow sleeper vehicles except for those instances um, aforementioned. Uh, Council Mayor Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, also agree, um, and I'll be in agreement with a motion that says we can't have these vehicles parking on our streets because, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody has learned from the last two years of this experiment that it's completely untenable and we can't do it. Um, but I am concerned in terms of the distinctions that we're making um, yeah, we can make the distinction between people who have ties with Longmont and people who don't, because we don't need to give a lot of services to people who are just passing through. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm okay with the idea that if you are a permanent resident of Longmont, um, that should involve having a sewer. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not okay with people being allowed to park on the street just because they um, have a job or family um, in Longmont um, and pay taxes in Longmont. Maybe that's the criterion, I don't know, um, because there are people who have um, you know, income but not a job and that's, that should be okay if Longmont is their town. Um, what I have a problem with is the idea that we can, require that people want to be like us. Um, you know, there are people that want to live in an RV just as there are people who want to live in a manufactured home. You know, lots of people think that manufactured home parks are an eyesore and, um, and we ought to get rid of all of them. Um, but that isn't right. And I'm not sure where on that continuum uh, an RV is. If it's an RV that's plugged into a sewer, um, you know, isn't that okay? Uh, I don't think you should have to be in coordinated entry and trying to get out of the RV if that's what you think of as your home. Um, so uh, uh, I just wanted to get that out on the table. Um, I agree that we need to dis to to vote on whether we're going to have this, this uh, um, meeting, this uh, cons of consortium of people who have some expertise in this situation and hash it out. But I just, uh, I just wanted to get the, the message out that I am not comfortable with 
telling people how to how they live their lives and what their house should look like um, as long as they meet the the basic public health needs of of having a sewer and not infringing on somebody else's property rights and leaving trash all over the public right of ways um, but uh, uh, I don't think we should tell we should have everybody wanting to aspire to a house and an apartment if that's not the way they want to live their life. Councilor Christensen. Councilor Martin, I completely agree. The gypsy in my soul says people ought to be able to live how they want. But the reality is, you know, this this leaves a uh, before we had sanitary sewer systems, we had huge plagues of cholera. I don't want the police to have to be endangered by having to clean these things out. That's not their job at all. And people need to be educated about the need for um, public sanitation and basic rules like that. And uh, I know you're not talking about that. I, I agree with you though, I really do. Um, and I do think this task force will be a good idea because we need to have further discussions. I would like, however, to bring up two points that um, have not been brought up. Uh, the basic thing that we're trying to solve is people who are living in their vehicle on the streets. That is not the only kind of an RV. I mean, that is not the only situation with RVs parking on the streets. Um, and also one of our constituents uh, brought up the problem that um, at various parks, the public, the, the parks are being filled with RVs in the daytime. People leave the generators on, which makes a huge racket. They take up all kinds of space in the parking, which is already pretty small, and nobody can use the parks. And, and the people adjacent to this have to keep their windows closed because the generators make so much noise and blah, blah, blah. So there's also a problem of them parking in parks and taking up all the space in the park and not even being there. They leave at night. So that's another problem. But, um, and I, I have mentioned this problem before when we talked about this and it has to do with this, this entire ordinance which has to do with people parking on the streets. My neighborhood is full of contractors and they have contractor vans. Now, according to this ordinance as it stands, a sleeper vehicle can be a camper coach, a camper trailer, a motor home, a multi-purpose trailer, or a trailer coach or a travel, oh no, a camper coach. That includes most um, I believe it includes most um, construction vehicles that, for instance, there's a guy in my neighborhood who has a, um, I don't know what it's classified as. He's not living in it. Nobody's living in it. But he needs to have this uh, at his home. And most of these construction guys do because they, he has wood in it. He has a table saw in it. He needs to take it to the job site. He doesn't have a place to put it right now. I don't mind it being on the street. It's fine. It's not like a giant camp RV. But by this law, as it stands right now, he wouldn't be allowed to keep it there more than 48 hours at a time. I really think we need to distinguish between people who are living on the streets in their RVs and people who are not. People who just have an RV, they drag it out for a couple of days to clean it off and um, put it, you know, then they put it somewhere else, but they shouldn't have to come down and get a permit to drag it out. Right now they don't have to, they can just take it out, have it there for a couple of days to clean it out when, you know, pack it up and then clean it out when they come back. We're not distinguishing between people who have RVs and just use them actually as RVs and people who have um, uh, construction trailers, which by this is classified as a sleeper trailer, I mean, by the current law, we need to actually have that discussion too, which has to do with what I was talking about earlier with uh, cars being 
uh, only allowed to park on the street in the same place for 48 hours. Um, anyway, so I want us to distinguish between people living in RVs on the street and just RVs that are used for as actual RVs a couple of weeks out of the year and RVs that are used for uh, construction trailers. Thanks. All right, so we're gonna go uh, Councilmember Waters, and then after Councilmember Waters, I'm gonna, regardless of what, actually let's go with you and then and then uh, no hands quite yet. Dr. Waters, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not, um, I, I don't think we're actually debating the motion. That's what I was gonna say, but go ahead. <laughs> so, so how would you, you wanna, Vote on that motion. I have I have something to say. Yeah, no. The, 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 so if we have so what I want to do is handle the motion that's currently on the table, and uh, uh, Councilmember Peck uh, made a motion. Councilmember Christensen seconded it about specifically making a safe lots down on Alaska Avenue. Um, well, then I, let me speak to one part of that motion. Go ahead. Uh -huh. right. um, uh, if that, that what I heard sounded very kind of involved. But I understand it's to get use of county land. I mean, there's a lot of stakeholders in in that decision. Um, if 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 the motion was to to figure out how to either uh, acquire or utilize through some arrangement that property or some property for people who um, are are living in RVs because they um, don't have an option, they're registered with coordinated entry and want to get into to more permanent housing, I would support that motion. If that motion was generally a place for people to just get off the street, no, I'm no. not gonna support that motion. So I, it would be helpful to have that clarified. Do you, want to, uh, do you want to make an amendment to that motion? I would accept that. Well, then I would, then I would uh, the, offer this amendment that, that if in giving that direction, uh, a site would be utilized to provide an option for Longmont residents living in RVs, not by choice, but by circumstance, registered with coordinated entry, aspiring to get into more affordable housing or more permanent housing. I accept that. I guess, uh, I guess, I guess my question is simply, um, we were gonna hear back, I thought, the, I thought the police department and city staff was gonna bring back some more information on, whether or not this is going to work, and so uh, here we are about ready to vote on it. And uh, the location down by Alaska Avenue—I don't know if there's any residents down there, but um, uh, where are we at on that, Harold? So I think part of it is, and I'll let Karen jump in. Part of it's the work that Joseph's doing, but Karen, jump on in. So, Mayor, Council, can you hear me now? With my earbuds, is that better? Yeah. So, so, so obviously, we we brought this back uh, as a recommendation from um, the council. They wanted to bring back the, the RV ordinance. So, um, so, that's really what we did. And we, council, at with all of the work that we. All of the work, I don't know what else to do with all the work that we were doing with, um, with COVID, uh, that we were behind in, um, you know, in really examining the, the trade-offs for you know, what it would cost in terms of the big lot. We also wanted to have um, Hope have some experience under their belts with their, with their safe lot that they established. They just established that in, um, in we don't have a we don't have a lot of so Ellie Berto, do you want to take it? Yeah. So um, can you all can you hear me? Yeah. So it's Karen's computer. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Karen has had several computer ways. Um, so I think yes, we were wanting to see um, kind of the. Um, how um, Hope's safe lot um, experiment would go. They have a month under their belt. Joseph actually sent me uh, a report and he can speak to his outcomes, but it is pretty early. We, we've not 
and they've only been doing it for a month. I'm not sure that they've housed anyone at this point. Um, I know that some have been have received access to some services. Um, so that that's that's what we're waiting. And I, you know, in the in the console com, I did talk to Mountain View, California, um, and they actually have an RV lot, and and there is some information around their costs and what, what they did as well um, for their their safe that accepts RVs. So um, Karen's gonna, we're gonna switch here, <laughs> put my mask on. Sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> the other thing that I was gonna say is that it is that we are also, um, you know, working on the whole idea of, of bridge housing. And, um, and so that is something that our housing exits group with, um, with Homeless Solutions Boulder County is, is, is working on. We have local funding that we have set aside for, um, you know, for bridge housing, for temporary housing. We also have, um, again, resources that have come into the, the county and we're looking at being able to use those rapid rehousing dollars for, for bridge housing. So we just, because of COVID and all the work that we had to do with that, we just didn't progress as a task force as fast as I think some of the council members wanted us to do, and we apologize for that. Um, but but we wanted to have more time with the safe lot pilot and see where that, um, that led us. And we also wanted to continue to work on repurposing money, rapid rehousing money, bridge housing, so to really to bring back to council to say we would, you know, here's how much it would cost to establish, say, a, a, a lot for RVs as compared to here's what it would cost for us to master lease um, units for people to be able to move into bridge housing rather than living in their vehicles. In a, in a so we were behind on that because of COVID and, um, and but we brought back what we had in terms of the, the RV ordinance. All right, Councilman Waters. I just say that if, 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 if the way, if Karen's point is, you can spend a dollar on bridge housing or a dollar on the investment in an RV safe lot, I would spend a dollar, the first dollar and every dollar on bridge housing. If it's one or the other, number one. My point was that um, I'm sympathetic to to Longmont residents who are in RVs by circumstance. If they're in an RV by choice, I, my, I, I wouldn't say you got to live like me, but I would say if you live like me, you are going to pay property taxes, which you don't pay in, in an RV. You are going to have to resolve disputes with your neighbors if you have them, which you don't have to do in an RV. You can drive away. I mean, there's to live like somebody who's going to, you know, burden themselves with a mortgage and all the rest of it, there are consequences. Different consequences if you don't. We make our choices, and I don't get to be held harmless for the choices I make. And I don't think the city ought to be obligated to hold folks harmless for the choices they make if they chose to live in RVs. We're all adults. And I understand if you're an adult with kids and you're in this by circumstance, the circum that calls for a different remedy. Um, but I just want to be clear, if we're, if, if we're looking for a, a way to address families in circumstance, living in a circumstance where they're not being, I want to do whatever we can, whether it's Councilmember Peck's proposal or, or not, but to use those dollars to do something else. But the other tiers, and I think that was a good way to lay it out, Councilman Peck, Councilwoman Peck, um, the, the, the travelers, or just the folks by choice who are, you know, living in Longmont, I don't think that we need to go to extraordinary lengths to accommodate them. I don't want to police chase them around. I don't think the neighborhoods ought to have to, to manage that as well, personally. But the third category, we need to get creative about or, or for and, and innovate and make highest and best use of whatever the resources are. So I'll stop. Can I answer council member or mayor Bagley's yeah. question? Yeah. Go ahead. So, the, the, the estimate that they used in creating a facility, and again, this is a rough estimate. Um, actually, let me take you back to California. So the one that they did find 
um, the city invested $100,000 to upgrade a site for um, a safe lot, did not include restrooms and other facilities on it. Um, they had to put lighting, electricity, other, other components into it. Um, and they contracted with a faith-based nonprofit. Uh, the original contract, it appeared, was $220,000. Um, and the information that they provided to Eliberto said that, um, that the next proposed budget uh, from the nonprofit partner would be closer to, to 300,000 to operate that facility. Um, annual basis, um, correct, Eliberto? That is correct, that's what they told me. That's, a, that's an annual expense. Um, based on what they're doing. Um, when we researched providing restroom facilities in the RV lot, the rough estimate on that cost was two hundred and seventy-five dollars to $300,000 of essentially capital cost to do it. So you see how they built a lot, didn't put other amenities into it. They were on the lower end of 100000 You provide more amenities into it, you then get into the the, uh, the upper end of the construction cost and then the ongoing operational cost, I think would vary depending on the group and, and how they were staffed and you utilize volunteers. My estimate would probably be based on what, you know, I've seen from them, 150 to 300,000 annually based on other operations. So I think that's the, answers you were look, looking for. All right. Yeah, Mayor Patel. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, as far as the specific motion on the table, I uh, am in disagreement and will not be supporting the motion as I think that there should be a generalized facility provided as far as uh, the city should be involved in the sense that if there's assistance needed for people that are looking to get into housing or they cannot quite afford, say, a full cost of staying at the RV park on Main Street, for instance, that the, there might be some assistance there, as well as similar that we provide to folks in our community who are in, you know, permanent housing but still need assistance for uh, living costs. So, I think that that would be necessary, uh, not a safe lot in the capital S sense, but a secured place where people can feel safe being. But I do feel that penalizing folks that do choose to have their lifestyle of living in a in a RV or something similar is not the right right method to go forward either, and that's why I can't support the motion on the table. And as I've told constituents who I've talked to about this issue in general, um, I am happy to support making the ordinance more strict once we have an alternative for folks or once we have exhausted all of our possibilities of having such an alternative. So I can't support the making the ordinance more strict until we have something tangible on our plate to provide that alternative for folks. So that's where I'll be on, as far as this motion and, and, gen, and generally what the subject's talking about. All right, well, the motion currently on the table is, are we gonna make a safe lot down there on Alaska Avenue specifically for uh, folks who have shown uh, shown that they are looking or moving towards some type of permanence based on Councilmember Waters' amendment. Uh, and that count, that motion was made by Councilmember Peck and was seconded by Councilmember Christensen, friendly amendment by Dr. Waters. That's the motion that's currently on the table. So let's go ahead, Councilmember Martin. Uh, I just want to say that wasn't quite how I understood the motion. I think Councilwoman Peck wanted to uh, bring together people to put together a specific plan for doing that, not are we going to do it? Is that correct, Council Member? Exactly. It's nothing more than a discussion. Uh, this is this is county land that is in the city of Longmont. There are no NIMBY issues at all. It's right behind the cement plant on uh, Alaska Avenue behind Isaac Walton. It is a dead-end street. And Boulder County Housing Authority their vision is to supply housing within the county. There are buildings there that possibly have bathrooms in it. I've already talked to the commissioners about this for four years. All I want is to, to get a group of people together to discuss the possibility and what it would take. 
would it really be that expensive if we use you know the fairgrounds dumping station if if the buildings have a bathroom if let's have a discussion that isn't going to hurt anything to discuss what we could possibly do moving forward so i'm going to call the question all right well we have to all right councilman martin oh i just i don't know do you second calling the question um no i i concur with uh, Councilwoman Pat, that we should vote on. All right, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. And this, uh, question's been called. It's been seconded. Not debatable. All in favor of taking a vote, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries unanimously. We're going to go ahead and vote. Let's go ahead and restate this. Sounds like the motion then is one that we are directing staff to uh, uh, can. Uh, form a, 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 I don't want to use the word task force, that, but to, to form a committee uh, made up of staff to go ahead and look into the possibility, specifically the costs, the time frame, process, et cetera, in order to create a safe lot down on county owned land located on or about this particular area on Alaska Avenue. And with the understanding that it would be used for those folks who are from Longmont looking to move towards permanency in their housing situation, other than living on the street. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, say nay. 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 So the motion carries four to three with myself. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez and Councilmember Martin opposed. So you have your direction, Harold. Yeah. Can I, Dr. I, Waters? That doesn't address everything in this. I'm nope. sorry. Can I? No, go ahead. Make a motion if you want to. I, I'm going to move that, they, that, we, that we also direct staff to bring back ch changes in the ordinance reflecting staff recommendations, understanding this uh, in, the, in time it, with this conversation that we just approved. I'll second. I'll second that. But can I just clarify the motion that basically what we it, it, uh, the motion is that we direct staff to follow through on their recommendations pertaining to the prohibition of sleeper vehicles on the streets, with the uh, with the uh, with the exception of the the things listed in the previous slides. That there are some exceptions they they presented to us tonight. Yes. Yeah. 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 Loading and unloading and whatnot. Correct. Councilmember Peck, let's just go Councilmember Peck, uh, Councilmember Dago Faring, and Councilmember Christensen. I would like to add uh, an amendment to that, that in the uh, part in, uh, I, I can't bring it up, but it is basically saying that they can't park on public streets. I would like to add um, any public property, for example, trailheads, um, city parks, um, that they cannot use those spaces for places. Um, so it would be any public property, not just streets. And um, does anybody uh, agree with that? Because we've had, uh, we've had emails from people saying that, you know, they park in the, the parking lots of city parks and sit there all day or all night or I'll, accept, I'll just uh, accept that amendment thank you <laughs> yes <fine>. so <laughs> uh councilmember christensen uh, i thought susie was first oh sorry susie yep you are first right um you know i guess i i am not comfortable accepting any kind of um you know read just any of these um, um, allowances or eliminating the allowances, unless we have some kind of alternative option presented as well. So I, you know, I won't be supporting moving forward with this. I mean, I, I'm okay with hearing what the recommendations are, I guess, or going more in depth, but I, I wanna know what, what other options there are for, for individuals. What kinds of solutions can we come up with first? Councilor Christensen. Um, would you please read that, what uh, 
Councilman Waters said, I'm unclear what the what we're voting on, but I would like us to clarify the situation for contractors because right now it isn't clear for contractors and we don't want to cut down on anybody who's trying to earn a living, being able to earn a living. I My neighborhood's full of contractors and I am very supportive of them. They're good guys. So the current motion on the table is to, to adopt staff, to direct staff to prepare an ordinance uh, following through on staff's uh, recommendation this evening that was in the slides that basically is prohibiting sleeper vehicles with the exceptions provided by staff. Um, those exceptions specifically were, Harold, help me out. You had the uh, loading and unloading. It sounds like uh, Council Member Christensen, was there, an, was there an exception in there for, for work, work vehicles? We'll have to work with the attorney's office to make sure that we carve it so you don't have an unintended consequence of work vehicles and those types of things. Because so. I, th I think really what we're talking about here is just making yeah. sure that people aren't sleeping on the streets in their RVs and then listing exceptions in an ordinance that would basically allow for us to allow for the situations that you mentioned, Councilmember Christensen, and those listed in the ordinance. Councilmember Martin? I just think the language that you're looking for is that if it's a vehicle that's a, you know, its form factor would have allowed it to be a sleeper vehicle, but it's not fitted out as a sleeper vehicle. It's at, it's for tools and lumber and stuff. Then it doesn't count, you know. My computer went all wigwaggy. Anyway, uh, 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 Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, uh, I will be voting against this motion because I don't feel that we're far enough along for an alternative site that we were talking about. And so bringing this ordinance and making it more strict before we have an alternative site would kind of make the efforts towards the alternative site seem less effective to me. Um, well, but I would like to state that what I feel it would be appropriate, I do agree with the recommendations that Steph has brought forward once an alternative site is in play. So I, I feel like the, the, the recommendations were, were spot on. I just don't think we're there yet as far as being ready to, to make that, that leap. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't see any hands up. I guess I'd say that I, I don't view these issues, as, I mean, they're, they're like cousins, but they're not, they're not, I think, going hand in hand. Uh, right now, we've got a real issue with people on the streets, um, even Deputy Commander Satter, you see him just subconsciously nodding his head. Um, we've got a real issue here. And uh, those people who are living in, the in their RVs on our streets, by definition, are not residents of Longmont. They, are, they don't pay property taxes. They're not living in, in homes. Um, we don't know. Uh, they're, they're, it's a problem. Now, um, in, the, in the motion that we provided earlier that we're going to be looking into is not about just a willy-nilly RV lot. Um, for people who don't want to live in houses, there's specifically Longmont South. We, the motion that passed was they're going to be Longmont residents who are working towards permanent home uh, homes in Longmont. So I, I don't view these as, as, as having to move forward together. I think that it's a good idea to get RVs off the streets. Um, it's more sanitary. It, uh, it's healthier for our community. And at the same time, we can then focus on getting a safe lots that will, I think, meet the criteria that we've already established. Councilman Martin? Then I think, thank you, Mayor Bagley. I think we need to, to include in, in the no parking ordinance, some kind of an interim solution where uh, for <laughs> four months, six months, something like that, we um, uh, come up with an arrangement where you can put the Housing use the housing choice vouchers on the place in North, places in North, place in North Maine, where you can have uh, uh, you know uh, dumping tokens or something that you can use at the at the fairgrounds. Uh, at one time, um, Joni Marsh was going to look at uh, negotiating uh, rental of some places at the fairgrounds at certain times and I just, I understand that none of those are good solutions. What I'm trying to avoid is people who have been 
relying on that if I move my car every 48 hours and dump at the fairgrounds and don't put trash on the streets, then I'm considered a good citizen. Now we're trying to say, yeah, you can have been abiding by all of those laws and you have a job and you pay sales taxes and you pay personal property taxes and keep your vehicle tagged and in good repair and we're still kicking you out of town. And I just think we should have some kind of an interim solution so we don't kick those people out of town because what we're doing is, you know, we're, we're essentially saying, yeah, you were a good Longmont resident and now you're not anymore because some other people abused the privilege. I just can't get down with that. Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. So uh, it sounds to me uh, like there are council members who would like to move um, that we direct staff to come back with a proposal to spend uh, $300,000 or more or whatever that number was uh, to, to, to construct whatever, to provide whatever the infrastructure is, lighting, showers, uh, uh, sanitation uh, system, um, and that we would, that would precede anything else that we would allow what we've just seen tonight to continue on the streets, putting our police officers in a position to chase it down, paying for the cleanup, et cetera. And I just have to say, for me, that makes no sense. Your point, Mayor Bagley, about these being cousins, not, not tied to one another. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, there is no proposal on the table to do what I think I've heard Mayor Pro Tem suggest happen. There's no, there's no proposal to build a facility. So given that, we would have an ordinance that goes on indefinitely until there's, until there's that proposal and it's, and it's completed. And in the meantime, we put code enforcement, law enforcement in, in the neighborhoods in, in untenable situations, it seems to me. Um, I think we ought to be clear on it. Um, if somebody wants to propose that we build out uh, a facility for others, for, for RV residents, other than those who are in them by circumstance, who are registered with coordinated entry and who aspire to permanent housing. And I'm not gonna support that, but it, it, because that's not the way I think we ought to use our affordable housing dollars. But if that's, if that's the proposal, somebody ought to make it. Otherwise, I think we have an obligation to the rest of the community to deal with this. Councilmember Martin. I, I don't think uh, you, you're right. They are cousins. Um, oh, talk about Councilmember Martin. It, 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 so it's 11 o'clock. I'm not just going to end the meeting. Somebody, I'm going to move that we extend the meeting, but I am going to ask that we hurry the end of the rest of the meeting along because we've been here a while and I, for one, want to go to bed. And sure, sure. And I'll, I'll second your motion to extend right. the meeting. All in, all in favor of extending the meeting, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Councilmember Martin. So um, what, I, what I wanted to say was that we don't necessarily have to build a really expensive RV, RV safe lot ever. Um, uh, what I would like to have is a three to six month interim solution for people who are living in RVs responsibly now um, uh, to be able to survive until they can make plans and they know what to do. So, uh, you know, we, I, I don't want to kick them out of town and they can't get to their jobs and they don't have any option of doing something else. Um, let's just, you know, even we've even given them a chance to, even if, if what, what happens is eventually they do have to leave Longmont, at least we've given them some warning longer than the, than the month it takes for an ordinance to go into effect. I think that we should be at least that compassionate. Councilmember Peck. I agree with you, Councilwoman uh, Martin, and that could be a separate motion. That w the initiation date of this ordinance is, and in the meantime, there are some ways we can uh, educate using the police with educating all of these contacts that they make in RVs, give them the ordinance, give them a timeline, tell them what it's, how it's gonna change. Um, that's a separate uh, motion. So 
let's vote on this one. And then if you wanna make that as far as when we're going to actually incorporate this ordinance, that would be a good idea, I think. Yeah, okay, right. that's a deal. All right, so we can, we, can, we can address that motion in a second. Um, but right now there's a motion on the table that we're going to go ahead and adopt staff's recommendations and, or tell, I'm sorry, direct staff that they go ahead and prepare an ordinance um, based on tonight's presentation. So all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. I was a nay, right. by the way. Say that again. I, I was a nay. I was an aye. All right. Aye. Raise your hand if you... Okay, let's do that again. Raise your hand if you're an I. All right, raise your hand if you're an A. Okay, the motion carries four to three with council members Waters, Martin, Peck, and myself four, and uh, the three other council members against. Councilmember Martin. Thank you. I would like to move that staff um, bring back uh, an interim solution of at least three months uh, where we would provide a way for people who pass certain criteria such as the state of maintenance of their RV and having an income um, that's tied to Longmont or having family, children in school. You guys know, Alberto's nodding, so I think uh, uh, he knows what those conditions are that we care about. Um, so that they have some warning before they're totally thrown out of town. Um, and that might mean, uh, you know, a designated parking place that has no amenities, but they get a, a token that lets them use the fairgrounds. I mean, some kind of option like that so that we are not running people out on a rail in, in two to four weeks because they just don't have time to rearrange their lives that way. Second. All right, Harold? Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask if, if we would have the latitude to come up with a, a, a broader range of, um, based on what Karen said in terms of some of the COVID funding and that we have available, a broader range of options that still is a bridge solution. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just that was intended as a minimum. Okay. And I guess the I guess the, the other thing that we're forgetting is these are RVs. I don't think we're running them out on a rail. I mean, they can literally start their their car and drive somewhere. And so they don't it's, have it's, a car. They only have the RV, and they can't get okay. to their job. That's my, the problem. My, my point is that if they have an RV that's working, they drive it somewhere else. They're not evicted. They're not. Um, it, it's it's not. We're not running them out of town. They are they are driving a vehicle, and so. Uh, uh, I'm going to vote against the motion because I, I would like to A, see RVs off our streets, um, and B, see what staff comes up with our safe lots. And I think that is the solution that, that, that the motion would naturally lend itself to, which is once we have safe lots, you say, by the way, you can't be on the street. Here's safe lots. And if there's no room, move on. Well, so, yeah, but some people are against having a safe lot because it's more expensive than than interim housing. So, um, you know, we're, we're, I think we're kind of losing track of what the solution is. And maybe when the staff comes back, we will unlose track of it. Um, but uh, if you have to drive your RV away and park it so far away with no public transportation that you lose your job, you know, it's kind of like the problems that we have with coordinated entry now, where you can't hold down a job because you're on the bus all day going to five different service stations around the, the great Boulder County area. Um, and what we'd be doing by saying you immediately can't park on the street is you're creating that situation where people with jobs can't get to them. And, and I want to provide an in, interim solution that does not create 50 more instances of that because it's an injustice. All right, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, the motion is to, uh, uh, the, the, you wanna repeat the motion? The motion is to create some type of interim solution that before we kick them out of town or ticket them, mm -hmm. that we, that we uh, uh, tell our police, which we don't wanna defund to do things like this, um, <laughs> 
uh, you know, but we're going to have them take on one more responsibility to become the RV enforcement agency. Am I getting that motion correct? Yeah, if you want to put it that way, you can, but that's not the way I put it, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm just, just pointing out what's inherent in the motion. All right, uh, and it was seconded. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. Okay, there were a couple people I didn't see lips moving. So we're going to go ahead and take this vote again. Raise your hand if you're for the motion. Raise your hand if you're against the motion. All right, the motion carries five to two with uh, myself and council member Waters against. All right, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to mayor and council comments. And Deputy Commander Satter, I noticed you, you, your hand went up. Are you an I or a nay? Uh, no, I'm just, just saying, I'm kidding. bye, thank I'm you. kidding, bye-bye, thank you. All right, okay, mayor and council comments. All right, council member Martin. Well, I just want to commend the council because what I have noticed about this debate that has not been true for a long time is that people have been taking positions based on their personal convictions, um, not on uh, which imaginary side they belong on or, or you know, who campaigned for their election or any of that stuff. It's, um, you know, We've been, we've been debating based on what we think is right and wrong and what the best way to get to something is. And it was just really wonderful to see and hear that. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Marcia. Councilor Mayor Beck. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, I, I heard from some constituents that there was a really important PRPA meeting on Friday, uh, a day long discussion about um, alternative resources or an alternative, uh, <laughs> it's late, <laughs> alternative uh, energy. And I was wondering if you could, if you could tell us, because we're going to be voting on that next month, um, can you tell us how that went? Mayor Bagley? I was, the, on, are you talking about the PRPA board meeting on Thursday? Yeah. I was in Houston, Texas. Oh, you were, so you didn't get to go. Did I, I did not attend that meeting. Did but, you ask uh, the mayor pro tem to uh, go in your stead? I did not. Mayor pro tem doesn't sit on that board. I was uh, on the meeting. I can tell you what happened, but not sure. as a member of the board. Go ahead so, if you'd like to. If you'd like to share. Well, okay. My other question is, uh, Mayor Bagley, are you going to be at the next meeting in order to vote on this? Uh, Yes, I. That's the. Uh, yes, I will be. Okay. Is this a? Is this a, is this a public? Is there, are you making a public point here, Councilmember Peck? Uh, kind of. I. I. I was very concerned about this meeting. I was waiting for. For you to go. Yes. And, it, it, uh, I didn't and, know uh, you were out of town, and I was hoping mm -hmm. that Mayor Pro Tem could go in your stead, since he is the. Uh, yeah. Well, that, that, that's not how that board works. Okay. So uh, there is no alternate for, for when I'm not present at that board. It is okay. not a, it's not a council appointment. Um, it is one by charter and uh, I vote not as a council member, but I vote as a board member. Okay. Um, that, is my, that is my legal obligation, but I don't miss them often, but I had an obligation down in Texas that I did not feel like uh, 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 sharing with council. And uh, I will still not share that with council. But once again, I appreciate my fellow council council members trying to, uh, you know, cause problems that aren't there. But anyway, anybody else want to make a comment? Yes, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I've been uh, doing what's called death cleansing, which means you clean out your house so you don't uh, saddle your poor kid with the process. So I gave away 40 years of National Geographics and I wanna thank the family who took them. They were delighted. They sent me pictures of them. They said how happy they were and that made me feel very good and uh, because I had a very sentimental attachment to them. And I wanna thank the guy from Tinker Mill who took a load of wood off my uh, front porch that I was also giving away. I've been giving away stuff left and right. So if anybody wants 
anything, I've probably got it. Just come to my house. All right. I guess my, I guess it's late. So I'm going to watch what I say, but I would just admonish and counsel my fellow council members, including you, council member Peck and you, council member Hidalgo Faring. Give me a call if you want to be, crit be critical of me in public. Um, believe it or not, um, a lot of times I just feel that uh, I believe that uh, a lot of our dirty laundry doesn't need to be aired here. And I tend to get defensive when people poke me. And so uh, don't want that to happen anymore. Okay. Um, so I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you and um, I would like you to do the same. All right. Well, you'll notice that I don't typically poke unless poked first. So, no. all right. Well, give me a call. We can talk about it, Councilmember Peck. All right. Anybody else? All right. Then let's go ahead and let's take a vote to conclude the meeting. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Harold, Eugene, anything? No comments. No comments, Mayor. All right. Can we have a motion? I move we adjourn. I'll second, second that. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Have a good week, guys. Bye.